Uh, welcome everyone to the April 4th meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, let's see, this open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely for the governor's extension of the executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. For this meeting, the ARB is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Please also make sure during public comment not to project any, uh, any slides on the background behind you. Anything uh, that's shown must be submitted in advance to the Department of Planning and Community Development. Note that anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. At this point, um, I would like to confirm that all members of the uh, Redevelopment Board and the Department of Planning and Community Development who are here this evening are present and can hear me. Uh, we'll start with Ken Lau. Present. Jean Benson. Present. Melissa Tentopoulos. Present. Steve Revelak. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair. And I'm Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. We also have uh, Jennifer Raitt uh, from the Department of Planning and Community Development. Present. And Kelly Linema, also from the Department. Present. All right. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, so uh, the majority of our agenda this evening will be the uh, the board's discussion, the deliberation, and voting on the uh, 2022 annual town meeting zoning warrant articles. So we have 18 articles this evening, um, of which we heard uh, the petitioner presentations over the last four nights of public hearings. This evening, uh, there will be no public comment period during this agenda item. There will be deliberation on each one of the articles and we will uh, vote um, on each one as soon as we have finished deliberation. I believe that uh, several of the petitioners will, are joining us this evening so that if there are any questions from the board, we may direct um, any questions or discussion to those petitioners if there are items that we would like clarification or if there are any proposed revisions that we would like to confirm before we vote action or no action. I'll remind everyone that um, this is a simple majority that's required to either um, vote to, uh, to support through uh, recommending action or to not support, which is um, re uh, recommending no action for town meeting. Um, and we will go ahead and get started this evening uh, with Article 28. I apologize, just one more item before we start. I do want to remind the board that we, um, there were several articles that we had asked that the select board weigh in on and discuss um, as part of their review of the Warren articles prior to this evening. We did have a discussion about those and I submitted information, both the planning department's memos, as well as information requesting um, feedback by last Wednesday. And um, I just wanted to let you all know that the select board declined to, um, to comment on, on those, those items. So they did not add it to their agenda. I just wanted to close the loop and let you know that we would not be receiving those comments. All right. Uh, so Jenny, if you wanted to uh, go ahead and bring up uh, the first article, we'll take them in order, starting with article 28 enhanced business districts. And again, since we've already heard, um, since we've already heard uh, deliver, uh, excuse me, questions and the petitioners present these, what I'd like to do each one, Jenny, if it's um, good with you, is to ask you to just uh, identify if there are any substantive changes that um, were made. I know that you went through and cleaned up the, um, the articles and removed any of the, uh, any of the, the notes and the changes that have been captured during the comment period. So I'll just, um, Jenny, ask you for any 
any comments or items you'd like to highlight before we begin each one. So we'll start with Article 28, Jenny. Okay. Um, basically, all of the articles that we're, I'm going to show on the screen um, have no longer have the track changes, as Rachel noted, and they have incorporated any of the comments that we heard from the board um, during the hearings. Um, and for a couple of them, I think, for example, uh, this one, the street trees and the solar bylaw, as well as maybe one other, there were some additional comments after the hearing by either board members or others who had been working with um, the department and the board on these bylaws, so Christian Klein, et cetera. Um, I don't think that there's anything different from this, uh, amend this proposed motion um, from the prior time that the board has seen it. So I don't have anything additional to add beyond what you've already seen before. Um, so some of the things, for example, that came up were around, we talked about corner lots. Um, we talked about visibility of all facades. Um, we incorporated some clarification on lobbies. Um, I don't believe there was, there were many other, uh, we talked about uh, beyond just Mass Ave and Broadway, we, we uh, made it say business districts more broadly. Um, I don't think there's anything else remarkable to note in this Great. one from the conversation Jenny, we had. Great, thank you, Jenny. Those are the highlights I had from my notes from that evening as well. All right, so I will run through uh, the roll call for the board and see if there are, um, are any questions and what I'd like each member to um, discuss or any questions you might have for the board um, and your uh, support for either action or no action on this item as we run through the roll call. So we'll start with Ken. Hi, I'm uh, supportive of this uh, article here, but I do wanna bring up one thing to discuss amongst the boards here uh, before uh, we um, do the final is under 5.5.2, uh, uh, section B, number four, um, the second bullet down. Um, can we add something to this, like subject to ARB review or subject to ARB um, exceptions? Because I think some of those areas uh, this this is requiring a certain amount of trans minimal transparency. Well, let's say if it's um, the food pantry or a daycare center where they may require a little bit more uh, screening just for what's happening inside, just because of the nature of the program. Uh, we're willing to. Uh, I, I was hoping that we we can uh, had some sort of exception there that we can approve. Uh, I was wondering what, what what does the rest of the board think? Uh, thank you, Ken. Ken, I think that's a Good discussion point. Um, you know, we do have flexibility with regard to um, in interpretation and ensuring um, that for, for those applicants who have extenuating circumstances that, you know, we, we do have some leeway with the interpretation of this, I think, in the way it's written, but we certainly can talk about ways that we might broaden that, which I, I think is a good question for the board. And I'll uh, Turn it over to Jean next to discuss that item that Ken brought up and any other thoughts you might have on this article. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Excuse me. I agree with Ken. A little clarification to make that clear would be helpful. And um, I'm not sure exactly where to put it. I have two suggested changes and two questions. <clears throat> Let me start with the suggested changes. The title, I think, would be better as Development Standards for Business Districts, because that's what they are. And I think it would just make it more clear if you looked through the table of contents and just the headings, what it was. Um, second is um, the first bullet in four. Um, we still have the word principal facade there, which when we discussed a few weeks ago, there was some question about what does it mean if two if it's a corner building with two facades, the facades facing two streets. So um, I, I, I don't think principal facade does it. I think um, ground floor, 
I don't know, but you know, the example I gave was, you know, there are a lot of businesses that are on two major roadways and they have potentially two principal facades, but I think we just need to clear that up a little bit with the word principal or maybe, you know, principal or principal facades or something, something to indicate there might be more than one. All right, so. Sorry, just before we move on from that one, would it be as simple as adding an, an um, S in parentheses after facade so that we identify that if there is more than one, it could be on either of the principal? I, th I, think, I think that's possible or yes, yeah, something like that. Okay. So, um, I don't understand the last, the sentence at the very end, one that starts, next page, please. The one that starts existing commercial spaces with frontage, exceeding the above dimensional requirements are exempt. I don't really understand how that fits into any of this. So could, could somebody give an explanation on what that means? Would you like me to? Yeah. Okay. Um, so on the Kin's um, suggestion, just kind of winding backwards, Kin's suggestion, we could amend this number three to make it clear that, you know, the board has the ability or, you know, you can think about how to maybe amend that section, which then would apply to anything here. Great. So I'll let you think about that one. Um, principle was meant, I think, and Kelly, please jump in if needed, but principle, I think this kind of, kind of goes back to where we started, which was Mass Ave and Broadway. And I think we were thinking that's the principal facade facing one of those streets is actually, that that facade is the principal facade. Is that what you were also thinking, Kelly? I don't wanna speak for you, but we did have this conversation in office. Yeah, I think it was that, um, you know, where you have two different facades on, on two different major streets or one primary street and then one secondary street. You may have a, you may have a building with multiple storefronts and one of those storefronts could open up on the secondary street and one could open up on the first. And it just seemed that the way this was written, there was sufficient flexibility for the board to sort of, um, to, to interpret this in different ways. Um, It's, it's not to say that you're avoiding the second facade if you're on two main roads. It's just to say that we want attention given to the facade that's on Mass Ave or Broadway, that that's the primary facade to pay attention to in general. But I, I, I'm open to other, I'm open to the facades being the solution there, but I just wanted to give you the, what the reasoning was behind keeping the word principle. On this hey, one- Rachel, can I interrupt for a minute? Sure. Can you inform the whoever's um, changing their name on the website saying no action Article 38 is improperly doing that and that should not be happening? If they're not willing to do that for them to leave. I'm, I'm sorry, what do you see happening? I They're changing their name on their oh, um, oh, Article It says no action on Article 38. That's just yes, not right. Yes, correct. I, I would agree. Please. That's, so that's rude. I, I, I usually, uh, um, addresses during public comment period, but um, it is inappropriate for, for anyone to provide um, any type of reaction, including using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen while the board is del deliberating or members of the public are speaking and for you to change your name indicating support or um, non-support of any, any item. So uh, you will be removed from the meeting if um, that continues to happen. Thank you, Ken, for pointing that out. I hadn't seen that. Sorry, Jane, I didn't to me to interrupt. Nope, that's a good point. Thank you. I understand. I appreciate it. Um, so the, okay. last, the last the last one was, I, I think maybe it's this phrase that's not quite right, exceeding the above dimensional requirement or right here. I, I think what we were trying to say is that ex if the existing commercial spaces already meet these requirements, then they're exempt. I think that's what we meant. And I was this rewritten, Kelly? <laughs> I don't remember seeing that before, but I may have forgotten. I don't think prior. That, sorry. Go ahead, Kelly. I'm sorry. No, in the, in the prior version, it was a bullet point under standards. Um, but I believe it was actually 
referring to existing commercial spaces um, where the, like if it's just a change of use and there isn't a change to the facade, it would be exempt from. I, I'm not sure it's exceeding the above. I think it's meeting these requirements. That, yeah. That's what I would suggest if I, I'll see what you wanna do, but that would be my suggestion. Well, they're not really dimensional requirements, right? Are you just saying yeah. frontage yeah. meeting, meeting the above requirements? That, that's what I was saying, yeah. I think that makes sense, but it's almost- Redundant. Yeah. Redundant, thank you for- Yeah, I, it may not be necessary. Um, I don't know how it became it's a stray without the bullet, but we can also delete it. Yeah, it might be redundant. Um, and now my big, do that. my big suggestion, um, if you can go up to the previous page, Jenny, you know, this, thank you. This started off um, and has evolved, I think in a nice way. And I think, you know, Jenny and Kelly have done a nice job evolving this. What got dropped off is one of the initial things we were thinking about, which is how to use something to make sure we activate the streetscape. And we've ended up with mostly you know, how something facades look. But I think we could add another standard that says something like, um, um, I didn't have it written out real well, but if you can go up to the previous page again, Jenny, um, up a little more, which would say something like the redevelopment board may consider the purposes of this section 5.5.2b in, in determining whether to grant a special permit, not whether, whether to approve a special permit environmental design review application, something along those lines, so that it gives us a little flexibility beyond only the facade to say, hey, this thing is not going to encourage pedestrian activity. So we're just, so that's what I'm suggesting get added. Can you just repeat that, please? I'm sorry? Would you, would you please repeat that? Yeah, the, the redevelopment board. board may consider the purpose of this section in, de, in um, determining whether to grant the special permit through in, environmental design review. Yeah, you can fill in the right section number. Yeah. Two. Something a little, so that's my other suggestion. Great, thank you, Jean. And that might be better under standards, but I'm not sure. That's where I was. No, except all the, standards, all the standards have to do with transparency and access, so that's not a good place for it. Yeah, maybe it would have to be a different. A maybe different have it in the best place, but anyhow, that's my, that's my other suggestion. Great, thank you, Jean. All right, um, Melissa, any uh, discussion on the points that were uh, brought up currently or any uh, further items re related to your either support or um, thoughts towards non-action on this item? Um, thanks, Rachel. I guess I'm curious about what the board was thinking in terms of the applicability piece. You know, I had mentioned at our last discussion about this being applicable for a special permit or change of use. Um, I think there's few, there's going to be, you know, the scope of the applicability will be limited for new construction and expansion. I think what we'll see more is reuse and maybe limited um, expansion on the footprint. So I think if we're really trying to do something, it's going to be um, in those smaller changes. And I wanted to hear what the board was thinking about that. Great, good question. We'll uh, definitely come back to that one and discuss. Steve? So I'm okay with all, with the uh, changes that Mr. Lau and Mr. Benson have. I'm still thinking about applicability, but overall um, I'm supportive of this. I think it will help to encourage um, attractive spaces as our commercial parcels are redeveloped. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. 
Um, I want to go back to the uh, suggestion that for that that Kin and and Jean were both speaking about regarding. Um, I think it was Kin. Correct me if I'm wrong. The second bullet point. It was the first standard. The first bullet point under standards. Yeah, just the required minimum transparency on the ground floor. I think we want to put in uh, with with exception from the ARB or something. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'll leave that to Gene to wordsmith it. Could I make a suggestion that perhaps um, we add that under three administration? And perhaps it's um, administered subject to 3.3 and 3.4, um, including consideration of any reasonable exemptions. Yeah, that'd be fine. Jean, your thoughts on that? Oh, you're on mute, Jean. Yeah, I, I think I think yeah, and I think you'd say including. Um, making reasonable exemptions from the standards, something like that. Right, or including provisions for reasonable exemptions. Okay, Ken, does that address? I think so. It might be a little vague, but it gives us, I think it gives us enough latitude. I think we'd uh, be okay. Okay, um, so I think um, we should weigh in on Melissa's question about also including in uh, two, the applicability to change of use in addition to um, the larger uh, redevelopment or new construction sections. Um, my, uh, I'll just note that I think that um, requiring some of the transparency and other items with a change of use would put an undue burden on some of the applicants and um, would in some ways uh, perhaps stifle d development in some ways, um, you know, again, because of the, the breadth of what we're requesting here and um, what the scope that comes before us sometimes in a change of use um, consists of. But I'll uh, turn it over to, to Ken next for your thoughts on adding the change of use. I, I would agree with you, I think. Um... I don't want to put uh, too much of an undue burden on somebody that's trying to uh, do something that's moderate, that, that's helpful, and and I, uh, you know I, I want to keep it in the word uh, development. You know, we want to encourage development uh, with that. And I think this would be one way of uh, adding one more hurdle that might be undue burden. I, I agree with what she says. I just think it's. Uh, it's going a little far for me. Right. Thank you, Ken. Jean? I have, I, I think Melissa's hit on an important point and I have a suggestion for this. The, the applicability wording, new construction additions over 50%, et cetera, is the exact same wording that's almost in the very opening sentence of standards. So I'm not sure we need to have them in two places. <clears throat> and I might suggest taking them out of the applicability part because the, the point that Melissa said that intrigues me is, and oh, by the way, I agree with Rachel and I agree with Ken that, you know, if somebody's just doing, you know, minor changes, just change in use, we don't necessarily want them to do stuff with the facade. Um, for the reasons Ken and Rachel said. However, for the uses and the idea that we should look at the purposes, that's very important. So I think if we should, if this applicability would say in the business districts, um, 
can take out all of the wording that should be in four. You know, in the business district's application subject to review, that would put all of those transparency standards in the facade part and the lobby and things like that, and yet allow us to do what I had suggested in number one, which is look at the uses and see whether they're consistent with the purposes. So I think that's the way to, to get at what Rachel and Kim, you were talking about, and hopefully get at what Melissa was thinking too. Can't hear you, Rachel. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Steve. I, I guess I have a question for the architects on the board. Um, in the event that you know a building started off with forty percent, uh, a forty percent transparency on the ground floor, and we needed to go to sixty, how much structural modification would that require? Depends on the the way that the facade was con constructed. It could be um, a significant modification, or it could be um, it could be fairly fairly minor. It could be taking out a couple of courses of bricks and adding a lintel, or it could be something more significant depending on um, what kind of the facade treatment it was. But yeah, there is, I sort of, I, I like Mr. Benson's revisions and I, I see where Ms. Tentacolos is going. I'm, yeah, I guess my, my concern is that I'm, you know, if it can be tricky enough to start a, start a business and um, my concern would be to add a big construction bill to, you know, their startup costs. But um, I, I'm I'm okay with where I think I'm okay with where we're at now. Thank you, Steve. Um, Melissa, I'll uh, see if that this change addresses the concern that you have, and if you have any other thoughts on this topic. Well, I like the intention of it. And I think what we're trying to do in terms of activation and being kind of thoughtful for the interaction with the public realm is important. Um, I think the opportunities are going to be limited with new construction and expansion at 60%. So I think just, um, and I don't, I mean, I see where you could see that maybe an um, can additional burden um, on a new business or change of use. So, I mean, at the same time, I think um, what Jean was saying, if I understood it correctly, allows a little bit more oversight. And Jean, you might have to re-explain that one to me to make sure I've got it, because you would remove it from the applicability and then you leave it only in design standards. Is that correct? Yeah, so my, my intention, and I'm looking at this, and I actually think it would work because it's in the the, basically what are the design standards that would mean that what Ken and Rachel were talking about, which is, you know, if you're just changing the use or just doing some um, moderate addition, um, you don't have to pay a lot of money to redo the facade, but because we took it out of the applicability part, it's applicable to anything, which means that if it's just a change of use, we can't deal with, we don't deal with the facades, but we can see if the per, if it meets the purposes of the development standards, which are the act, you know, encourage pedestrian activity, active street, and development of active ground floor uses. So by splitting that out, I think it gets at what Ken and and Rachel were concerned about, which I am too, but also gets at what I think we had discussed a few weeks ago, give us a little way to say, look, that seems to be really the wrong use to put here. I'd support that. And I hope that's what this says now. Right, I'll, I'll ask before we move on to vote on this, I'll ask Jenny for, for her thoughts in terms of the way that this has been reworded because I also you know, want to be mindful of the fact that sign permits come in through the same process as well. And, and again, I just want to not 
um, confuse the matter and and open this too wide in terms of what some of the smaller items that people sometimes come in front of us for. But Jenny, I'll see if you have any concerns about the way this is. Yeah, I mean, that would be my biggest concern. I think having this apply to things that are very small and an applicant is really just looking to change out the sign and, you know, change the restaurant, change the retail store. I just don't think that that's what we were ever aiming for. I mean, as much as I would like to change some of the facades, I don't think that that's the way to go about it. Not for a business that's just trying to, you know, they might be making... A, you know, a preliminary investment, and then there might be a longer term investment. And I think we want to appreciate that there are many businesses that kind of eventually stretch to making that longer term investment, but not make them do it right up front um, at the risk of and the expense of their business potentially. I don't think that was the intention. The intention was what it says here, new construction additions over or, you know, redevelopment that touches upon the sort of more significant um, situations that I was hoping that this would be applicable to nothing, nothing more than that. So I don't think that this applies to signs and I don't think that this applies to change of use. My reading of it would not suggest that it does. Correct. Even with the new changes, correct. Even with the new changes. Yeah. Great. If you, I highlighted them when you tell me you're good with them, we'll take out the highlight by the way. So can I, can I weigh in for a second? Yes, of course. Jean. So I think in applicability, we should probably add a sentence that says, you know, you know, this is not applicable to, you know, sign, you know, determination of sign. Yeah, you know, the section is not applicable to requests for approval of signs. But I think as it's now written, not number four, but number one allows us to look at uses if somebody comes in for a change of use. So the um, example I'll give is the Chase Bank that um, came before us a few weeks ago. I would say that this would allow us to take a look at, does it encourage pedestrian activity, maintain an active street, encourage development of active ground floor uses, because we're saying that we, should consider the purposes of this section. So as I read it now, it would give us the ability to do that for a change in use. We may choose not to, you know, or if it's going from one restaurant to another, it, we certainly wouldn't, but there are some where we might. And I think that's the benefit of having it go this way. That's my concern again would be just to be clear my concern about having this apply to change of use is that not every change of use comes to this board actually um and it is you know it 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 not not subject to the board's review but then making it subject to the board's review is like adding an additional special permit process but jenny it wouldn't because this still um has to require a special permit and edr review so um well, gee, if it's under 2,000 square feet, no. That's right. Then we wouldn't do anything with it. Right. Exactly. Good point, too. Right. There are some limitations where there are no special permits or EDR review. Jenny, does that um, number three, which limits it, the scope to those items that fall under 3.3 and 3.4, does that address the concerns? that you just brought up there in terms of those items that actually don't come in front of us for change of use? I think so. I'm not completely sure right now <laughs> reading it. I'm, I'm trying to read it to oh, understand what she to, is yeah. trying to say. Um, I'm, I would be concerned that we would have somebody come to the board for something way beyond the scope of what they were planning. That would be my biggest concern. Um, I, I think I think this clause is all we have basically to deal with it. Well, the other clause we have is it has to come before us for a special permit. Right. It has to already be in the special permit. Right. It has to already meet the. Um, criteria elsewhere for needing to come in to the ARB 
Okay. For a special permit. Right. Okay. Um, if we are okay with these things, do you want to go back to this one before you move on? The principal facade? <laughs> yes, we can do that. Um, uh, so I will just run through again after um, Kelly and Jenny's um, explanation about the principal facade really meaning NASAV or, or Broadway. Can, um, would you still be interested in adding the, the multiple, the, the facades with an, with an S here? No, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't put the S there. I, I, I would say if both facades, if both facades are equal, then, and if we, and if we agree that it's equal, then I would ask the developer or the owner who, to choose one. Is which or, or it, we could it, make that determination as to which we. Correct. So one would be chosen, but right. I think it's undue burden to do both just because it's on a corner lot. I, I, you don't have, it, it just it doesn't make sense architecturally. Agreed. So, okay. So we would just leave this as is. Uh, Jean, thoughts on leaving this as is with the explanation and the, um, the opportunity to define for the applicant, the principal facade. That's fine. I don't think it will come up very often anymore. Great, Melissa? I'm fine with that too. Great, Steve? Uh, also fine, Madam Chair. Great. All right. Are there any other um, any other discussion points or um, revisions uh, for for this item? I'll just run quickly through. Ken. No. Jean. No. Melissa. No. And Steve. No revisions. All right. Is there a motion to uh, recommend action? for Article 28, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment for Enhanced Business Districts. Motion. motion. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, go ahead, Ken. I'll second. Uh, right. Motion to uh, recommend for action as amended. Thank you, Ken. Second. Thank you, Melissa. We'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And Steve? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Just, just a quick point of information about yes. this vote. I mean, we voted this in, which is great. So Jenny needs to set, put this all in the package. So we'll have one chance if we find a comma missing or something like that on Thursday. Correct, correct. So we will review the memo on, on Thursday and be able to make any final um, final revisions at that time. Jenny, did you have something the, to add? The draft report to town meeting is what you're reviewing on Thursday. And okay. I'll also send it in a Word document after it's posted tomorrow afternoon um, to the agenda. But um, it's it's the it'll be voted on on Thursday as the final report. Um, I still do need a little more rationale for that vote, if um, possible. Couple of, couple of, um, you might add some language. That would that would be very helpful. I, I we we spent a lot of time talking about the edits, but I want to make sure we capture why why the board votes to recommend action or no action in a future um, vote sure. potentially. In, in this one, I think the purpose pretty much says it though. So the, the purpose being, if you could just state the purpose for, for Jenny so that she can capture well, that, it's, Jean. It's the, it's the purpose right here that she's got the arrow on. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Jenny, does that give you what we need, basically restating the, the purpose from? I think, oh yeah, I can work with that. Okay. I can Great. also go back to the first hearing. I just want to make sure that you you just keep that in mind when you're voting, please. Um, sure. To make some statements of support or lack of support and why. Great. Please. Thank you. Thank you. We'll All right. Uh, so uh, moving on to our next article, which is Article 29, 
the zoning bylaw amendment related to street trees. Um, and Jenny, again, I'll I ask you to um, highlight anything that you would want to note that has um, been revised from our discussion. I actually am going to ask Kelly. I, I don't think this one changed substantially, I, with the exception that I think we had heard about watering, but we just we Correct. did not incorporate watering into this. Um, Kelly, I don't know. No, I agree. There were there were minor modifications that were made I, during like directly during the hearing, um, and those are reflected in the text here. There was a recommendation to add end watering, but um, we determined that was redundant with maintained. Um, because Great. watering is a component of maintenance by the American standard of nursery stock standards. Great, thank you very much. So I'll now open it up to the board for discussion and um, uh, making sure that we are highlighting um, either our support or concerns as we move towards action or no action on this item uh, for the notes that Jenny is putting together. And we'll start with Ken. I'm in support of this uh, article uh, for in, uh, encouraging uh, sweet trees. And uh, I have no comments as far as any changes or anything like that. Great, thank you, Ken. Jean? I'm supportive too. I have two uh, minor wording changes. <clears throat> um, if you can go back up a little bit, please. Um, oops, I'm sorry, you must be back down. There we go, a little more, more. There we go, in E, there should be no comma after the word circumstances. And in, in D, I would suggest the phrase or other standards the redevelopment board may designate should be moved to the end of the sentence. So it would say nursery stock standards for a period of less than 36 months from the date of planting and then put that in. Yes, those are my only suggested changes. Any thoughts on um, support or concerns on this article? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a fine article. As, and again, the purpose says it all. I mean, we have serious um, heat islands along uh, the main corridors. The town's made a commitment to both, you know, adaptation and mitigation for um, for climate and trees do some of each. So, you know, I just think this is an important step. And, and it also says, and you know, this is again in the purpose, people tend to like to walk where there are trees, stop where there are trees in the summertime. So it also helps with um, um, encouraging pedestrian activity on our main corridors. Great, thank you for summing that up so eloquently, Jean. Uh, Melissa. Um, no additional comments in terms of action. I support it. I think similar to Jean, I mean, I think, you know, walkability is not just, you know, sidewalks, but it's attractiveness, it's the shade. Um, and then this also contributes kind of nature-based solutions, you know, planting trees towards, you know, mitigating built, you know, built environment impacts. Um, so thanks. Thanks for bringing that forward. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. That's very helpful. Um, Steve. Um, yes, one, well, one first, a, I guess a suggested edit okay. in 634D, um, where the last sentence where it says public right of way are exempt. I'm wondering if that should be public way, um, mirroring to mirror the words in the definition of shade, public shade tree. Thank you, Steve. I think you did point that out at our first meeting as well. I, I noticed that this is in 6.3.2 as well. Kelly, could you chime in? I think we did talk about this, but I don't know why they, um, it still says. Yeah, no, I, we talked about yeah. changing the definition, but I um, neglected to make that change throughout. So I think we can update okay. that. Not a problem. I just wanna make sure we're consistent. So public way is okay for everybody? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to change this one too. And this one. There. Another one. No. Okay. All right. Anything else, Steve? Uh, yeah, in terms of general comments, um, I do note that there was some opposition to this and, you know, mainly concern over the town's ability to take care of or to properly care for forestry trees. Um, when I first moved to Arlington, it seemed like about half of the trees had the middle lopped out of them and they just looked like a bunch of bushy Ys. Um, I think over the last couple of years, and especially since hiring a full-time tree warden, we've gotten a lot better at it. And I think it's an area where, you know, we're taking shade trees a lot more seriously and, you know, it's an area we're improving. Um, I support this for all of the, you know, for reasons my colleagues have mentioned uh, in terms of providing shade and, um, you know, provi providing shade, dealing with stormwater and um, reducing heat island effects. So I, I am supportive. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. And I am supportive as well for all of the reasons identified. And as um, was pointed out in the um, Department of Planning and Community Development memo when we first reviewed this, also its um, applicability with uh, the goals of the, the master plan has been identified in terms of pedestrian walkability and enjoyment of the um, pedestrian experience in our commercial neighborhoods. Um, as well as mitigating heat island effects. Uh, so uh, are there any other items that uh, board members wish to uh, bring forward on this article? All right, seeing none, I will see if there is a motion to recommend action on article 29 as amended. So moved. Second. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll take a vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Steve. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will recommend action for Article 29, the zoning bylaw amendment related to street trees. All right. Um, the next article. One second, Article 30 is a zoning bylaw amendment related to solar energy systems. And again, I'll turn it over to Jenny to highlight any significant changes that may have been made um, through the revision process. I'm actually going to turn it to Jean and Kelly, who I believe worked with Talia and Shelley to finalize and sort of uh, took in all of the comments during the public hearing and a little bit after and made some edits. So maybe Jean. Yep. So if you could go down to the next page, the, the one big change, I think it's actually the only change if you keep on going down, Jenny to four, is the neighboring properties. So this this is something that Ken raised um, during the previous hearing. Um, and it was look, we don't want this to prevent someone else from building a building nearby. We don't want this to prevent people from planting trees or cutting down trees or having to prune trees. So um, uh, Talia and I and, and Shelly Dean, who's not here at the moment, worked on and ended up with 6.4.4. And, and Ken can speak on this, but I think he felt it was fine. And um, I felt that it met what we were trying to do and was a nice way to do it. And I think that was the only change. Kelly, did I miss anything? Oh, you're correct. That is the, that is the change. Great. I believe that Talia had spoken directly with Ken about this after that other conversation. Right. I'll let right. Ken speak I, I, for himself. I'm, no, I'm very happy with uh, what the outcome was. That's good worth nothing. Great, thank you both for working on that together. 
uh, let's see. So we'll run through any questions. Um, and if I could just start this time. Um, and Jean, maybe I'll direct this towards you since I know you've worked a little bit on the wordsmithing of this one. I have a question as to whether or not there is a conflict in the wording um, of, uh, let's see, where under 6.4.1, where it states the redevelopment board may require a smaller percentage of the roof area to include a solar energy system when at least 50% of the roof area is not viable for solar energy system. And then under 6.4.2a, it says that there um, a solar energy system is not required um, when there's no solar ready zone or the solar zone is shaded for more than 50% of daylight hours annually. So if that's already an exemption, we wouldn't need to require a small, smaller percentage um, in that first section. I think that's a good question because this came up before. And I'm, I'm sorry, Shelly's not here. She couldn't be here till later this evening, but her thought was, you know, 50% usually makes sense, but what happens if it's 40 or 45% of the roof that's available? It would still make a lot of sense to have solar on it. Um, so there needs to be some ability to do that. So, so we added um, that part that uh, allows us to require a smaller percentage, but I think you're right. I think we have to do something I think we have to pick one of the two. Yeah, I think we have to do something with A. Um, I, I think the way to do it is to say, but people help me out here, where it would say in A where it says, or oh, the solar ready zone is shaded for more than 50% of the daylight hours annually, unless the redevelopment board requires a solar system anyway, or something like that. Or perhaps just identify where there is no solar ready zone period. And then again, our ability to reduce it for when it's less than 50 is granted above. So it's not an, it either, to me, it either has to be an automatic exemption or we're going to review it and decide whether to exempt them or not. Yeah, let me just look at a solar ready zone. Um, okay. Yes, I think you're right. I think you're right, Rachel. We should just delete it from A. Yeah. Can I uh, say one thing real Absolutely. quick? Absolutely, please. Um, when you put things in zoning that says subject to the ARB review and, and, uh, and review and qualifications, as a person who's developing a project, uh, a developer generally looks for minimizing um, risk or so understanding it so if if we have to do solar he understands that we have to do solar so he puts it in his pro forma and does and does it and it, it either pencils out or doesn't pencil out and he doesn't do it but when it's uh, subjective to uh, a board or someone's um, opinion then it's risk and that in itself will stifle uh, some development that's what I'm just trying to say, I'm not saying one or the other, but if we just pick something and then let and then let it lie and say, hey, this is what we want, but not subject to any, because then you can't calculate that. That's I just don't see it that way. Working as as uh, as in in the encouragement, this this will seem to me like another uh, hurdle that I don't want. I don't want this solar to be a hurdle. I want it to be a bonus. That's a fair point. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we um, take other questions, comments? Um, maybe, Jean, we can come back to this one and and uh, re review the rest of it. Um, so I just wanted to make that one comment. Otherwise, I'm I'm very supportive of this. I think it continues to um, move forward the goals of our um, of our 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 uh, climate um, 
our climate goals within the town. And um, I, I appreciate the, the comprehensive approach that was taken to, to putting this together. Um, but I, I, I do wanna make sure that we come back to that, to that one item. So uh, Ken, I'll, I'll go to you next for, for your thoughts on this one yeah. article. I'm supportive of this article. I, I, I think uh, I think if we can work out some of the language, I think I would it would be fine. I think this is this meets our goals that we want to do, and you know, and I think that's I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you, uh, Jean. Any comments? Um, I, I don't have any other comments. I'm very supportive of this too. I think it fits right into the town's um, net zero action plan and the responsibility we have as a community um, to deal with uh, climate change. Um, as, to the, as to the one piece you mentioned, Rachel, maybe I think Shelly Dean, who was integrally involved in this will be coming later, I think. So maybe on that piece, we might wait and take sure. all the other comments and everything else on this. Sure, we, we could definitely decide to um, table this this vote and we would take a, a um, motion to do that until the later in the in the process mm -hmm. if we um, if I, I would agree it would be it would be great to have her weigh in on this as well. Um, any other comments, Jean? No. Great, thank you. Uh, Melissa? Uh, no additional comments. I'm supportive of, supportive of this, and I appreciate all the effort and kind of work that has gone into it to make it work. Um, so, Jean and team, so thank you. I think, um, you know, it's just another report out that addressing climate change um, has to happen, not just on an individual level, but on a community level through these types of policies and actions. So I think that reinforces that and it moves kind of, you know, the net zero action plan is only as good as the implementation that comes from it. So I see that as a positive, this, um, this article. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Steve. I am supportive of the article. I believe it um, helps, will further the use of renewable energy sources in the town and assist us with meeting our goal of net zero emissions by 2050. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, so at this point, um, I'd certainly be interested in um, tabling this until um, the uh, Shelley, who worked with uh, Jean and, and others on crafting this article, is able to, to join us. Um, so I would suggest that we move through the other articles and then circle back to this after we finish with Article 45. Um, so is there um, a motion to table this, the, the vote on Article 30 um, to the end of uh, our deliberations? Or maybe until Shelley arrives. Um, I I think if we could if we could do that at, at the end, Jean, I think it would just be 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 easier rather than to keep going back and forth. If that's okay, we'll okay. confirm with her that she's when when you see her pop in, we'll just confirm with her that she'll still be available um, this evening. And if we if we have to uh, to take something out of order, we'll do so. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll make that motion you suggested. That. Great, thank you. Is there a second? Second. All right, take a vote, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Steve? Uh, yes to table. And I am the yes as well. So we'll come back to Article 29, or excuse me, Article 30. At the end, or when Shelley arrives, if she's not able to be with us for um, the balance of the articles. All right, we will now move on to Article 31, which is a uh, zoning bylaw amendment uh, containing five administrative amendments. Um, and I think as we've discussed these before, these are all necessary and um, appropriate amendments that have been identified by the Department of Planning and Community Development um, as we seek to bring clarity to, um, to the zoning bylaws as they've been put into use. And I'm supportive and I will turn it over to Ken for any comments. Okay. 
Yeah. Sorry. I was just trying to check. Okay. Article 31, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm fine with that and I'm supportive of it. And uh, I have no comments on this right now. Or, or not, I have no comments, period. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you, Ken. Gene. Uh, I'm supportive too, and I don't have any comments other than I think it's good we once a year uh, try to fix things that have come up in the bylaws. Great, thank you. Melissa. Yes, supportive of this and in agreement with Jean in that the, this is proposed so that we are making the job easier and making things more clear for applicants. Great, thank you, Melissa. Steve? Uh, I agree that it's always good to clean things up and add clarity where possible. I am supportive. Great, thank you all. Uh, Jenny, do you have enough? Yeah, that was all great, okay. thank you. Great, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, let's see, is there, so there are no proposed amendments to uh, Article 31. So is there a motion to uh, approve Article 31, the zoning bylaw amendment for administrative amendments. So motion. Me, not approve, recommend action. So motion to recommend uh, action. Great, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm the yes as well. So we will be recommending action on Article 31, the zoning bylaw amendment uh, containing the administrative amendments. All right, uh, moving on to Article 32, which is the zoning bylaw amendment related to zoning, the Zoning Board of Appeals rules and regulation. Um, Jenny, any, I don't believe that there were any major changes in this one? There were not any changes to this one now. Great, thank you. Um, we'll start with Jean for any discussion or um, comments in support or not in favor of this. Um, I'm glad that uh, the chair of the Zoning Redevelopment Board and I think Jenny too brought this to our attention and it seems like the right thing to do. It's consistent with how um, the zoning bylaw works in many other ways and how um, the redevelopment board has the authority to do its own rules and regulations. So yeah, I support this. I don't have any suggested changes to it. Great, thank you, Jean. Ken? I'm a supporter of this uh, article and I agree with Jean. Uh, the zoning board should have their right to make their rules just like we do. Great, thank you. Melissa? Um, I'm supportive of, the, of this for the same reasons um, Jean and Ken just mentioned. Thank you, Steve. Yes, uh, I'll note that I, uh, to the extent that I'm aware, the ZBA is the only town border commission whose rules and regulations are partially codified in a bylaw. Um, I don't, I, I think they should be like any other board and have the ability and flexibility to create their, create and amend their own rules and regulations. So I, I am supportive. Great, thank you, Steve. And I am supportive as well for uh, the same reasons that were just identified by my colleagues. So is there a, uh, there, were, there were no amendments proposed. So is there a motion to recommend action on article 32? Um, the zoning bylaw amendment related to the Zoning Board of Appeals rules and regulations. So motion to recommend action. Second. I'll second. Thank you, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We will recommend action for Article 32 for the Zoning Board of Appeals rules and regulations. All right, uh, the next article is Article 33, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment related to the definition of half story. Um, there was some discussion 
during the um, public hearing. And I see that several of the clarifications that were identified were included. Uh, Jenny, did you have anything specific that you wanted to highlight? No. No, I think that we just incorporated everything that was discussed. You know, we amended this during the hearing, which was to sort of consolidate, as I recall, and we we came to an agreement that it was okay to have this kind of a detail in the definition rather than as a separate section, which is why it's consolidated. And then we added the waves to uh, illustrate uh, better how the half story might look. Great, thank you, Jenny. Ken, any commentary? No, I'm supportive of this and um, and all the changes that now that were made. Uh, Steve's wave is good. And uh, I think this also helps clarify it and makes it easier to understand. Great, thank you, Ken. Gene. Yeah, I, I think this is fine too. Thanks to the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals to bringing this to our attention for this extra clarity. And we did also speak with, as you know, the building inspector about it. And he thought this was appropriate too. And many times he's the one who gets to apply this also. So I think that we have the approvals of the folks who are gonna use this most often. Great, thank you. Melissa. Um, I support the action and yeah, I think, you know, when you hear from staff and that it makes it clear, I think that's an important um, amendment to the zoning bylaw. Great. Thank you, Steve. I just want to note that although, you know, a half story may look deceivingly simple, it is sometimes it is tricky to get the words right and down on paper. Um, you know, I, I applaud the chair of the ZBA for bringing this clarification forward and I am supportive of it. Great, thank you, Steve. And I am supportive as well. Um, is there, so we did not uh, make any amendments during our discussion this evening. So is there a motion to recommend action for article 33, the zoning bylaw amendment related to uh, definition of half story? So motion to recommend action. There are seconds. So move. So we'll second. A second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. We'll take a vote starting with Ken. Yes. Thank you, Gene. Uh, yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will recommend action for Article 33, the zoning bylaw amendment related to half stories. We'll now move to Article 34, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment related to porches. Um, and Jenny, again, I'll see, I don't think that we had any major modifications to this one. Oh, I, there were not any changes since the last time we discussed it during the hearing. Great, thank you very much. We'll start with Ken for any commentary. No, I think this is good. It clarifies, um, uh, what porches are and makes it, easier for uh, people to understand and uh, for the zoning board to uh, enforce. So I'm very supportive of this. Great, thank you, Ken. Gene? I agree, I'll add again, thanks to the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals to bringing this to us, asking for the clarification and that both he and the building inspector had a chance to look at this. And again, they're the ones who deal with this most often and they're appreciative of these changes. So I think that's good. Great, thank you. Melissa? I support it. Great, thank you. Steve? I am happy to see that um, we have clarified that projections into minimum yards includes porches. Um, so I, I, this is a very, very, it's a, it's a useful clarification and I, I'm fully supportive. Great, thank you. I am as well. Uh, is there, so we did not make any amendments. Is there a motion to uh, approve, or excuse me, to recommend action for Article 34, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment relative to porches? Motion to recommend action. Second. Second. Thank you, Melissa. I'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. 
And I'm a yes as well. So we will recommend action for Article 34, the zoning bylaw amendment related to the definition of porches. We'll now move to Article 35, the zoning bylaw amendment related to yard encroachment. Um, and again, we did not have any significant changes during the uh, discussion uh, during the public comment period. So I will uh, start with Jean for any comments on this article. Same comments I had on the other one. I think this is a good idea. I appreciate the Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals bringing this to our attention for this clarification and both he and the building inspector um, had a chance to look and consider this and they both think it's a good idea. Great, thank you. Ken? I agree with uh, Gene and uh, what he said. I'm a supporter of this. Thank you, Melissa? Supportive, yes, thank you. Thank you, Steve? Uh, yes, this is the new material in section 539 is similar to what the ZBA had been imposing as a condition on special permits. Um, and I think it's um, you know fully appropriate to add it to the bylaw. So I'm supportive. Great, thank you, Steve. And I'm supportive as well. Um, so since there were no amendments made, we'll take a uh, motion to see if anyone would make a motion to recommend action for article 35, the zoning bylaw amendment related to yard encroachment. Uh, so motion to recommend action. For a second. Second. Make a vote, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So we will recommend action for Article 35. All right, uh, the next will be Article 36, the zoning bylaw amendment related to large additions. Um, we did have a little bit of discussion um, during the uh, during the public hearing on this item, uh, Jenny, I don't recall. I don't believe that any substantive changes were made as a result of that discussion. There were not any changes following that discussion. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so we'll start with Ken. No, I have no. Uh, I'm supportive of this uh, article and. Uh, I have no questions right now. I have no questions at all with what's here. Great, thank you. Jean? Guess what? I appreciate the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals bringing these clarifications to our attention and that he and the building inspector uh, took a close look at them and think that they're necessary and will help in clarifying for them and for people who are reading the zoning bylaw. So I support this too. Great, thank you. Melissa? Um, ditto, same as Jean, I support it. And I think the ZBA has done a good job bringing these things forward, so thanks. Great, thank you very much. Steve? Uh, I am also supportive. I want to note that the, um, that the changes proposed are effectively bringing the language in the bylaw uh, to match the way this provision has been interpreted. It has been an, a, you know, I'm aware of a few cases where it has been the source of a confusion. So it's, um, I think it is a useful clarification and I'm glad to see that we're making it. Great, thank you for that commentary. That's very helpful. All right, um, so we have not made any amendments. Is there a motion to recommend action for article 36? The zoning bylaw amendment related to large additions. A motion to recommend action. I'll second. Thank you. Take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So we will recommend action for Article 36, the zoning bylaw amendment for large additions. We now come to Article 37, the zoning bylaw amendment for unsafe. Uh, structures. And there was one change during the um, public comment period where we added um, or their designee to um, the uh, item in terms of who could make the determination that the structures were unsafe. 
um, in discussion with the Director of Inspectional Services. So I will uh, ask Ken for any questions, commentary, or support. I'm supportive of this Article 37. Uh, uh, I am also supportive of the change saying Director of Inspectional Services or their designee, or their designee uh, which is fine. Uh, I think this is, uh, I'll, let, I'll let you phrase it, but uh, I'm supportive of this. Great, thank you. Jean. So you think I have this memorized. Do you? Well, I appreciate the Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals bringing this to our attention and the need to clarify this and that he and the Director of Inspectional Services both looked at this and thought it was appropriate. In, and the reason they're bringing this to our attention is there have been at least one or more instances where the determination was made by a third party that might not have been appropriately made or with the input of inspectional services. So just, just clarifies that it needs to be a town decision in these circumstances. Thank you, Jean. Melissa. Uh, same, I support it. Thank you, Melissa. Steve? Uh, I am supportive. Uh, since this is, I believe this is the last of the uh, ZBA articles, I'm going to take this a moment to express my gratitude to ZBA Chair Kristen Klein for bringing these proposals forward. Um, I just want to say that the ZBA and ARB have sort of different scopes of authority under our bylaw and some generally work in different areas. Um, you know, although the ZBA works with, tends to work with smaller projects, um, you know, their hearings affect a lot, a lot of people and it's extremely important work. So I'm glad to see the two boards working collaboratively together and I hope we can do so in the future. I support this. Great, thank you, Steve. And I, I really appreciate that um, recognition of the collaboration between the ZBA and the ARB and all of the work that um, Christian Klein and the ZBA as well as the um, building inspector uh, put forth in creating this article as well as, as many others. Um, in terms of interpretation and um, ensuring that this would um, clarify and codify uh, current interpretations for others. Uh, so we have not made any amendments this evening. Um, is there a motion to recommend action for Article 37, the zoning bylaw amendment related to unsafe structure? Motion to recommend action. Is there a second? Second. Take a second. vote. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a vote, Ken? Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will recommend action for Article 37. Okay. So we now get to Article 38, which is a zoning by law amendment. Um, noting that two family construction would be allowed by right in the R0 and R1 residential zones. Um, Jenny, were there any changes that were made by the petitioner between our public hearing and uh, what we see here tonight? There were not any changes made. Kelly, can you confirm that? Confirm that there have been no changes made. Great, thank you very much. Um, Let's see, so let's go ahead and start discussion with Ken. I have to one, one question. We did talk about setting some square footage. I think Gina had brought that up uh, at the last discussion. And so the proponent for this did not uh, want to uh, make that modification. I believe you're directing that to Kelly. Or uh, Jenny. You don't want. It, it, it is my understanding that the petitioner was not um, as favorable to that modification. That's fine. I just want to understand that. It's all okay. So, so this is, is as is. As presented. This is as was sub submitted by the petitioner. Yeah, okay. their proposed main motion. All right. Um, I just want to make this clear uh, that this. Um, I've been getting a lot of um, emails and. A lot of questions about this, and uh, this article has nothing to do with affordable housing. Um, and I, I think uh, the proponent of this made that clear in, in their statements. I think um, 
uh, as far as uh, building, just encouraging building larger buildings, um, this does not do that because it says it still has to fall within the uh, single family uh, setbacks and, and, and open space and all that stuff. It does not, this also does not um, include increasing parking. It's still the same parking that's required for single family. And there's been some talk about um, by uh, increasing this from a single family to uh, two family that our uh, uh, infrastructure is not set up for this. And um, I, don't think, I don't think that's uh, quite a correct statement just because uh, in the last, I don't know, 30 years, um, our, all our, um, which is, I believe, where the infrastructure was designed at that point in time, that our, our, uh, our water usage has uh, greatly diminished because uh, we're using uh, uh, water energy uh, conscious uh, apparatuses now where the toilet flushes at one, 1. 1.5 gallons or 1.3 gallons, even 1.1 1. 1 on the really efficient ones from what used to be like five gallons. Our shower heads are, uh, um, use, spits out a lot less water. Same with the faucets. Um, we have dishwashers now, which uses more than, I mean, less than half what the water is for you to wash by hand. So I think our energy conference, our water conservation uh, has increased and made uh, the life expectancy of our uh, design uh, that was done in the 50s much better and last. Um, so the only question I had, and, I, and I, this was this came up to uh, with me uh, the last time this was brought up, and actually I, th I believe I voted against this, uh, a ch a zoning changes, but this time around, I think with the fact that the, uh, there's such uh, great support for this right now, that uh, I'm willing to uh, uh, support this article and move it forward to town meeting and let the town decide. And uh, I'm okay with that. So that's where I stand right now. You can, Jean. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna say a few of the, the same things that Ken said and then some others. I think I've I think we have received more emails about this article than any other article uh, that's been before us for I think the you know five years that I've been on the redevelopment board. Um, many people sent in emails opposing it, and many people sent in emails in favor. Yeah, I just want to go through a few of the themes from the opposition and um, give my reaction to them. One of them, which uh, Kim mentioned, um, was that we don't have the infrastructure to support it. And that I think is incorrect, both in conversations with people in the town who know, who know what the infrastructure can support. And, um, as Kin said, um, water and wastewater flows have actually gone down in the past years um, because of all the water saving devices that are available. Um, um, you know, there's not going to be loss of open space, things like that, because um, there's no change being made to the dimensional requirements the open space requirements, um, the, anything like that, that would um, um, fill up more space on a lot. Um, it, um, it shouldn't affect the value of people's homes at all, as, as has been pointed out by the redevelopment board. There are about 182 family homes currently in the single family districts, plus some multiplexes, some condos, some apartments. And, uh, you know, I live in the R1 district. There are no uh, two family homes on my block, but I can walk a block away. And there are two family homes and 
houses right next to them have sold in the past couple of years for no less than they have on the blocks next door that uh, don't have any uh, two family homes on them. So I don't see this as causing any diminution in value of um, people's homes. And, you know, um, a lot of people have said, well, you know, there are teardowns happening in town. Look at the R2 district where um, little single family homes are getting torn down and replaced with um, two families. Well, what's happening in the R1 and R0 district is smaller homes are getting torn down and replaced with bigger houses. So we're not in a status quo situation where things are, aren't changing. Our neighborhoods are changing. And the real question is, what do we want to have the neighborhoods be? And do we wanna provide an opportunity for people to have some more housing options to um, live in town? Um, so I have read all of the letters with arguments against, and I'm not persuaded by them, quite frankly, except, except for one thing that I want to mention. And that leads to the change that I would like to see in this, which as Ken pointed out, I mentioned last time, I would like um, these in the R0 and R1 zone to um, be limited to 1,850 square feet of heated living space per unit. They can be less, but they can't be more. Where did I come up with 1,850 square feet? That's um, the state's smart starter home limit in 40R. So there's a, a real basis for that. Now, why do I think that's important? Because I think what will happen otherwise is that houses will get torn down, which they will anyhow, and will and we'll get two very large uh, two families that will each exceed that amount. I had an interesting conversation. Oh, let me just say one other thing first. So I don't think we can control prices in town, but I can think we can try to damp them down a little bit by putting a limit on the size of, of these buildings that would be coming in. As we know, state law does not allow us to put limits on the size of single family homes, but state law does not prevent us from putting limits on the size of units in two family and larger homes. So we are permitted to do this. I had an interesting conversation the other day with Arlington's chief of police. And I asked her, how many of the officers, and they're in 60 some number of officers, I forgot the exact amount, live in town. And she said, almost none of them live in town because they really can't afford to live in town anymore because the prices have gone up so much. And they all need to live within 15 miles of town because that's some rules. So they live in a lot of the surrounding towns where housing is less expensive. I think one thing that we can do, and I think it's one thing that we should do, is limit the size of these units, as I said, to 1850 square feet of heated living space, deed restricted. So people who might not be able to afford large single family homes to people who might not be able to afford larger condos or apartments in two families will have something. Is it gonna create affordable housing? No, you know, um, but is it gonna create some housing that way that some people will be able to afford to live in Arlington that they won't be able to afford if we don't put a numeric limit on the size of these units? Yes, it will. So I, I am willing to support this. I think it's the right thing for the town to do with the size limit that I recommend. Thank you, Jean. Um, what I'd like to do is to take the initial comments and discussion from the board members, and then we will, um, I believe that Annie Laporte is, uh, the petitioner is here with us this evening, and I'd like to um, <coughs> ask her to, to address the suggestion you made. Um, before we move to Melissa, I'll just remind everybody that this there will be um, no public uh, comment this evening on these agenda items. 
um, the public comment uh, public hearing was closed during our last Monday's meeting. Um, so if you could please um, put your uh, hands down if they are raised, we will not be taking public comment. I'll also remind people uh, to please not gesture approval or disapproval of the articles as they are being discussed. That was one of the rules of conduct that we did identify at the beginning of the meeting. Thank you. Um, so I will now go to uh, Melissa. Um, Rachel, I did have a question in terms of where um, the housing production plan um, kind of stood, the status on um, the selectmen, if they had adopted it or accepted it. Uh, for, for which the housing production plan or uh, housing production. they tabled that uh, discussion. They did not vote uh, one way or the other uh, at their meeting. They do, currently do not have a date on their schedule for, um, for taking that back up. Thanks. Um, so Rachel, you wanna hear comments from me in terms of this proposal at this point? Uh, yeah, any any, any um, thoughts you have to further the discussion um, sure. towards towards moving towards action or no action? Well, um, just you know, for the record, given my experience, you know, my, I'm an urban planner by trade. I've looked at housing, economic development, so um, has been interested in this um, policy as being pretty innovative and coming forward. We've seen it kind of nationwide. I think, however, you know, I'm inclined to maybe give some pause given kind of where we are with the housing production plan. It was a coincidence kind of that Annie had brought this, you know, just in time as we were putting together strategies for housing. And I think my thinking is I'd like to kind of understand how we can strategize better together for a package on um, housing policies and work with staff um, for some thoughtful implementation on this, um, as opposed to, you know, how I see it currently, um, although it's a good, you know, kind of concept proposal, it is kind of independent and um, at this point, you know, kind of running, you know, running a little ahead of where I see our community needing to socialize this idea a little bit more so. Um, in general, I think, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, affordable housing, you know, as Jean mentioned, and as that the applicant had mentioned to us several times, this is not intended as an affordable housing um, initiative, but more, you know, creating housing options. And I think that's still very important. Um, but with a mandate from the state on the MBTA communities, looking at three family um, and more so throughout our community, I think maybe we can turn our, our efforts and kind of find um, a little bit more alliance where the state is in terms of our meeting those requirements um, and less on, you know, kind of this more independent policy and try to tie in our, our efforts together so that they kind of are in sync with the housing production plan. I would like to see um, the selectmen, you know, accept that and understand kind of you know, what's behind that housing production plan and those recommendations and to weigh in on that a little bit because we are predominantly a residential community. So it's important that they chime in on that. Um, and so, I mean, I am a little bit concerned, you know, kind of size, you know, I think we did hear a lot from, you know, the McMansion um, versus two family. If we're not controlling the dimensions, I understand that, but I think if we're trying to limit the Mc McMansion piece, my thoughts are, you know, I think there's a different mechanism for that. Um, so I think we have to kind of think through that a little bit. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where, where my thoughts are right now. Great, thank you, Melissa. Uh, Steve. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think there are two ways to sort of look at Article 38. Um, one is as a policy piece. Um, and aside from, you know, it's got a policy policy side, but it also has a political side. I mean, the, you know, there has been a great deal of correspondence and debate and passion 
about Article 38. And for that reason, I'd like to spend a, maybe a little more time than I have in, with other articles sort of explaining um, you know, my reasoning and, and thoughts about it. Um, fortunately, I think the policy side is, is fairly straightforward. Um, I understand that Ms. LaCourt proposed this article after seeing a number of smaller single family homes in her neighborhood uh, replaced with much larger ones. And from her perspective, you know, she thought a building of that size could accommodate two families. Uh, the smaller dwellings would have a, you know, would cost less, and we would be gradually adding uh, supply at the same point. Um, now these, a lot, of, we do have quite a few older homes in Arlington, and they are going to be replaced at some point. And what we're really discussing is what are they going to be replaced with? So over the last nine months, uh, new single family sales that I have seen listed in the Arlington Advocate have ranged from $1.7 million to $2.6 million. That is sort of our current status quo for new single family construction. Uh, new half duplexes have ranged from 1.1 to 1.7 million. And that's really the cost aspect we're talking about. The difference, the difference between a 1.1 to 1.7 million dollar home versus 1.7 to 2.6. Um, if we were to adopt Mr. Benson's size limitation, maybe you know that probably would go down a little bit. Now these half duplexes aren't cheap by any stretch of the imagination, but I think they are far less expensive than you know the new single families that are going up. Um, during the first half of 2021, the median price of a single family home in Arlington was about $960,000. And towards the end of the year, I received a brochure from one of our realtors, uh, you know, basically putting the average sale price of a single family home at a little over a million dollars. So if you want a single family home in Arlington, even a used one, it's going to cost you about a million dollars. That's where the market is and that's where we are now. So the pro to me, the prospect of getting uh, new construction for just a little more than what a used single family costs is significant especially since new construction will be up to code. It will have tighter envelopes and it'll be more energy efficient than what we, we were building 50, 75 or 100 years ago. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about sort of what I see as the you know, long-term climate change impacts about this. Um, land use and you know, there are, climate change is really a greenhouse house gas emissions issue. Um, and land use and transportation. This guy should be recused. Land use and transportation play big roles in that. Excuse me. Um, I believe that was Carl Wagner. This is your first warning. If you interrupt the deliberations again, you'll be removed from the meeting. Oh, Go sorry. Ahead. This doesn't seem like a public meeting. Carl, this just seems like a lot you, of may, you may please remove yourself from the meeting. Jenny, would you help me help Carl remove himself from the meeting? Thank you. Go ahead, Steve. I apologize for the disruption. So uh, no worries. I will just try to wrap up quickly. Um, you know, a good portion of our greenhouse gases come from personal transportation. And it's my understanding that in order to get to net zero, we will have to completely switch over to electric vehicles and reduce the number of vehicle miles that, you know, we drive. So this is why smart growth policies, like having housing near transit and jobs works. Um, I think we, you know, I hope that we are willing to have a little bit more of that in Arlington. Um, and I think if we're serious about avoiding the worst effects of climate change, I, I think we will have to get more comfortable with, you know, allowing more people to live here because we are so close to so many job centers. Um, I think this is a, you know, a small step in, in that direction and I, I hope we can take it. So I am, I am supportive of this. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Steve. And I apologize again for the disruption to your comments. Um, I just wanted to add, I, I agree with um, my colleagues that this is a, um, a really interesting proposal and one that um, aligns with a lot of the goals that, that we have discussed as a, as a board in terms of housing choice, um, the environment, addressing the environmental impacts of um, that we are trying to address in the town. I, I also really see the merit to what um, Melissa has suggested, which is to 
take the good work that has been done in creating the housing production plan and look at a lot of these strategies as a more comprehensive and connected, um, as more comprehensive and connected policy, as opposed to um, this, which again, I see as um, a, a net positive for the town, but which could be combined with other strategies um, to potentially be, be more effective. So one of the items that I want to bring forth that we discussed back in 2020 as a board when a similar article was proposed, which was you know, to perhaps look at requiring a, um, you know, from, from a conversion from a single family to a two family, a percentage to the affordable housing trust fund, or again, some sort of, um, some sort of an interconnected policy change um, in addition to a comprehensive education piece for the public who um, may not fully understand this. And I appreciate um, Annie LaCourt sent to the members of the redevelopment board, which is posted um, with the meeting minutes, uh, a fact sheet that she has developed uh, with the, her partner petitioner, um, Laura, for how to start explaining this to the um, to the members of the public and town meeting members uh, at the precinct meetings. But I think there's a really comprehensive um, education piece that is required that gets to, again, a lot of the items that both Ken and Jean and, and Steve spoke to to dispel some of the um, some of the items which are um, in, in many ways unfounded, which are being um, identified. And I would hate for this to move forward without the appropriate um, education and um, background that's required in order to, to make this a successful um, article in front of town meeting. And it's something that I, I brought forth at our last meeting and I think we saw an example of when this is done really well and very comprehensively with the ADU article that we saw last year, which again was um, backed through quite a bit of research and um, quite a bit of uh, documentation, which ultimately helped inform and educate not only this board, but the members of, of town meetings. So, um, I'm, I'm interested in um, you know, hear, hearing from Annie LaCourt. I know that uh, Jean had a specific question for her with regarding um, the, uh, whether she would consider um, a, potential, uh, a potential cap on the size of the, the two family units. Before I ask Annie to address that, I'd like to go back through the members of the board and see if they are also interested in having Annie um, review that as a as a cap as a um, as a condition for support of of this article. And I'll start with with you, Ken. Um, I can go either way with uh, what Jean said. Um, I was more interested in what you said about uh, having a linkage fund where um, that a certain percentage, you know, like 2% or 1% of the sales would go to an affordable housing account. Which I think we have already have established already, right? Correct. And, uh, you know, with, with new sales, all houses, that they all go in. This is an addition above that. And I think that would be a, a great uh, linkage to affordable housing which this was not all about, it, this does not, this, this is about choice, but having that linkage there, uh, it makes it more interesting for me. Um, I think the setbacks uh, that are already established for single family houses gonna pretty much gonna control the size of the house, I think. Um, so, you know, and if they're a little bigger, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's the market. Uh, I think what you know, we're trying to give market choice here, 
And I think that's okay. That's what I think right now. Thank you, Ken. Um, Jean. Yeah, thank you. A few things. I mean, Jenny may know this. I, I'm, and um, she doesn't know what I'm about to say, but she may know the answer. Um, I actually talked to a lawyer about a year ago asking if we could do linkage. And I was told we did not have the legal authority to do that sort of linkage. Um, if we did, it would be great. Maybe Jenny knows differently on that, but uh, that's my understanding that, that uh, you know, we don't have the authority. There would need to be special legislation passed to give us the authority. Um, I have more to say, but I wondered if Jenny knew the answer to that. Sure, Jenny. We do not have the authority. No, it, it's basically, it basically constitutes an impact fee, which is not legal. Um, there's not a way to do that without, as uh, Jean noted, some sort of special legislation or home rule petition, um, something other, some, something like that to that effect, but we do not have that authority. It's a good, good idea, good suggestion, but unfortunately not something we could do under this amendment. Yeah, um, on, on the size, I mean, there are two things. One is um, we, we do need to see, we, we don't have to do what the market wants. There are times where we can say, the market is doing something that's not, not exactly what's best for the town. And what are we gonna do about that? We do that all the time in zoning. And I think it's appropriate to think about doing that here for housing in this circumstance. You know what um, the um, building inspector told us um, when this came last time was on the larger lots, we would expect to have pretty big two families if this were approved because the larger lots, you can still have the setbacks and open space and still have um, very large uh, two family homes. So. You know, Ken is right, there are gonna be some 6,000 square foot lots where you might not get more than 2,000 square feet per each unit, but there are also many, many lots in town that vastly exceed 6,000 square feet. When we're gonna get a duplex or a two family where each one's gonna exceed 2,500 square feet. And that's why I think it's essential that we say, look, there's something we can do here. And that's something we can do here is try to get some housing built that's no longer getting built in town. And that is housing of a starter home size. So, you know, that I'm sticking with that. As, as to, you know, what Rachel and um, Melissa um, both said, I definitely am sympathetic to, um, this would have been better if it came as part of a package strategy, but I think it's okay to go forward to town meeting without being part of a package strategy, but I would only go forward with the size limitations. Thank you, Jean. Melissa? Um, I don't really have any further comment on this. Okay. Thank you, Steve. I think Mr. Benson's suggestion for a size limitation is very practical. Um, and I would like to, if possible, I would hope, I'm hoping to hear what the uh, proponent, the articles petitioner feels about that. Great, thank you. Um, so at this time, um, Annie Lacourt, I believe that you are here with us this evening. If you're able to, um, unmute yourself. Um, if you could just introduce yourself, first, last name, and address, and uh, we'd love to have a discussion with you about whether or not you would be um, interested in entertaining the uh, size uh, restriction. Um, so I'm Annie LaCourt, 48 Chatham Street here in Arlington. Um, I would reluctantly entertain that motion. Um, I, I believe that uh, we have more flexibility and it's more likely to produce more units without it. But um, I would like to get to the floor of town meeting and be able to debate the merits. So um, if that is what the what makes the board comfortable uh, moving this forward, um, I'm comfortable with that. 
Great, thank you very much. Um, let's see, I'll uh, go back to uh, Jean for um, any other any other comments you might have. No, I, I appreciate very much um, um, Ms. LaCourt um, having that point of view and articulating it to us, because I know it's not um, ideally what she would want, but um, I think it would be a better way to get it to town meeting. So thank you very much. So Jean, um, where would you propose introducing that? Because I think that's the next thing if, um, again, we are to take a motion one way or the other on this, we'd need to identify where we would add that language so that we can again then just review it with any LaCourt and make sure that um, she's in agreement with any recommendations that we make. I think I think in the in the two places, and that would be in the table and um, in um, the, the, the two tables that are there, there would just be a footnote for two family and duplex dwelling that says, um, Neither unit may exceed 1,850 square feet of heated living space deed restricted. So that would be my suggestion. Um, maybe Jenny has a better suggestion of where you, I go. Will you just repeat it one more time for us, please? Um, neither unit um, shall exceed 1,850 square feet of heated living space comma, deed restricted. And that would footnote, or Jenny has an asterisk, both there and then in the next one down, the, the two Ys. And I think that would do it. Would you need to add that asterisk to both two family dwelling as well as duplex, Jenny? Yeah, it should, or... be, yeah, it should be for both of them, yes. So that would be the way to Ignore the asterisk right now. It's just, it's just a reminder, it'll, it'll become something different. Right. Okay, um, Ken, I'll go back. Sorry, go ahead, Jenny. Oh, just... Um, Deed restricted as in affordable? As in that, affordable, but it's not affordable. I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't have, I can't have thousands of things open in front of me. Um, could somebody go into our definitions too? Because I don't think that we have that. I think, I think we just say as affordable or we would use a definition so it's clear that it's um, affordable housing. But it's not affordable. It's not affordable housing, Jenny. You're just saying, okay. Are you just saying deed restrict? Can you Besides, describe it for me? Well, then the the deed the deed to the units will restrict them to eighteen fifty square feet of heated living space. I see. Okay. Okay. If you want to move that phrase somewhere else, that's. Fine. I think I might. That would be my suggestion. And yeah. I was confusing it with some. I thought you had a different intention. Okay. You could put it at. You know, you can put at the bottom by deed restriction, neither unit shall yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you for helping me understand that. By deed restriction, comma, neither unit shall exceed. Yeah. Can you may I quick make a point of clarification here? Please. Um, so on the second table um, where you have the asterisks, would those would that asterisk not instead be on R0 and R1? because we wouldn't be having that same restriction. Okay. Correct. correct, that's correct. Okay. It would be on the Y for R0 and the Y for R1, not where the asterisks are. Thank you, Kelly. Wait, Jack, can I ask uh, Jean a question? Sure. Jean, so is this for perpetuity or? If, if it's deed restricted, it's for perpetuity. So if someone wanted to, we'll say 10 years down the line, 
um, have one of these units and their family grew a little bit and they wanted to uh, um, do a small addition like like anybody else that's allowed to do that, they're not allowed to do that then, right? Correct. Because they're in a special category. Uh, they're in a category special because category. They, because they bought in knowing that. Yeah, they would have bought in knowing that exactly. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to get an understanding where you're coming from. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know one of one of the advantages for that is it keeps certain housing at a certain size. So if the whole town was like that, it would be a real problem. I would never suggest that for the whole town, but to pro provide a variety of housing options, the same way you did restrict some affordable housing. Okay, uh, I'm just asking questions, Gina. Yeah, I'm not trying I understand. To... Yeah, yeah, good questions too, as usual. Uh, okay. So Jenny, just before we leave that, I think that the asterisks um, where you were under class of use, the asterisk after two family dwelling and duplex would get removed since you now have them under the Y. Right. I just wanted to clarify that before we moved on. Kim, did you have any other questions or comments now that we have that clarification? No, I, I think Jean's winning me over. Steve, uh, Steve, any questions yeah. or comments? I'd like to propose just a small friendly amendment to the wording uh, where it currently says neither unit. Um, I'm wondering if we could say neither unit of a two family dwelling or duplex dwelling. That's fine with me. I accept that friendly amendment. That looks fine. Yes, thank you. Uh, Melissa. Um, while I'm thinking through this, you know, I can appreciate what Jane's proposal is trying to do in terms of the limitation. I mean, I think the land economics of, you know, how kind of housing works those houses will be, you know, equally expensive in terms of, you know, affordability piece. Um, it's not going to have, you know, a significant impact. I mean, by square footage, maybe a little bit in terms of some si size, but, um, you know, new construction with a couple hundred more square feet. I feel like, you know, this is kind of the analysis that some of this is missing um, with regard to moving this forward. And I feel like some of the implications of, of thinking through this with this strategy and now putting forward, even though it's more of a limitation, you know, it's not, you know, it's not sitting well with me without the outreach, without the understanding, and we're going to bring it to town meeting will be a lot of misinformation, a lot of lack of understanding because we haven't had the outreach um, in any meaningful way. Um, and my concern is that, you know, it, we're, we're going to create, a, you know, a little bit of a storm there in town meeting without real information and analysis, and we won't be able to respond well. Um, and there's not too much precedence to kind of show elsewhere how this has been working. Um, so even with this modification, I'm not inclined to support it at this time. Thank you, Melissa. Can uh, I just, can I just, go ahead, please go ahead, Jean. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, you know, questioning what Melissa said. I just want to sort of say I agree with the part that says this is not going to cause a, a steep decline in the price of these because the price of land in Arlington is so expensive that it drives up everything and construction costs drive up everything. But what I've looked at as I've been looking at the real estate listings is the larger the units, the more expensive they are. Um, you know, the square footage, the price you pay for square foot's about the same, depending a little bit on the unit and how it's built and what it is. But um, the larger square footage, the more expensive they're gonna be. So this takes, 
I agree with you, not a big bite out of it, but I think it takes a little bite out of it. And I think it's a good little bite to take, but I, I understand completely why you're not going this direction on the whole idea. Um, Rachel, Go ahead, Melissa, please. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of it and want to kind of under, you know, kind of share that I have an open mind about kind of moving a policy like this forward. Um, it's just that, you know, with the analysis, I think even even with some of the social kind of arguments that we've heard around diversity, equity, inclusion, I mean, you know, we know historically there's been racial racial segregation and that's come up in some of the letters. I mean, but some of what we need to look at is just kind of, you know, the social variability, you know, if we're all at one income level affording Arlington, you know, how diverse is that? Um, it's just something that, you know, I want to kind of look at the linkage fee that we talked about that that does require a home rule um, petition, but you know maybe that's where we should be working. Some of this effort needs to be put in the hard work where we actually need to make a difference. Um, I don't. I see this creating a lot of controversy, but I don't see this getting us where we want to be in a meaningful way on you know the affordable housing or in that zone where it matters for people to make a difference here um, in terms of the diversity of the population in the biggest way that I mean diversity. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I think I'd like to, at this point, just go back to Annie LaCourt now that we have the uh, wording um, identified. This is your um, proposed amendment and I would like to ensure that you feel comfortable with what has been um, suggested. So if you could review that and let, let us know if you'd uh, like to propose any changes or if this is uh, acceptable to you. Um, well, I mean, I've been following the discussion um, I guess I'm a little bit concerned about this idea of by deed restriction, which restricts a family from expanding their home as they, um, as their family grows. Um, but um, I, I would just like to see it get to town meeting floor for debate. Um, you know, I also appreciate uh, Melissa's bigger picture view of uh, the need to have a complete strategy and a complete set of policies. Um, and, you know, I'm usually the person who's not hot headed and is prepared to wait the time to do that. Um, that just, I'm just over the edge at this point. <laughs> um, so, uh, let us proceed with this amendment and see where the board is at. And then, um, you know, if what it means is we're going to spend the next year working on this, I'm I'm in for the long haul. Great, thank you, Annie. I appreciate that. Um, and I'll again, I'll I'll um, just say too that, and again, like like Melissa, I'm I'm I don't want to put words in Melissa's mouth. I am supportive of this um, this policy change, but like Melissa, I would like to see this part of a more comprehensive plan and I and I would really want to work together with with Annie if if this doesn't move forward um, to ensure that um, we are able to craft something that um, is easily understandable and comprehensive and um, backed by backed by the, the research and um, um, documentation visuals, all of the things that are needed for, for the public to, to understand this, this change, which I think in terms of housing choice is, is important. And it, it isn't, again, I think we've all made clear, it's, it, this is not a specific, specific um, it's not about affordability in the capital A sense, um, but that's, that's, uh, that's what I, I'd like to see happen, but I also will respect, um, you know, my colleague's decision if, if this does move forward. And again, I really appreciate Annie bringing this um, forward because I, I think it is a really um, important strategy for us to take a look at in the town. 
Um, so I'll, I'll go through once more um, to see any if there's any additional discussion before I see if someone would like to craft a, um, a motion to, um, to move us forward. So we'll start with Ken. Yeah, I, I like, to, uh, like Annie says, I, I would like to like move this forward. Uh, if not just to start the debate uh, in town meeting and really put this onus on us moving this, moving this together. We've been talking about this for a long time and talking about adopting certain things. And, and I think this is a, a potential spearhead to get uh, everybody involved in talking about this and moving this forward. So I'm okay with moving this up to debate. I mean, it's, it's we're not voting this in, we're just moving it forward. So we can continue this discussion and moving this issue across. So I'm okay uh, with moving this forward. Great, thank you. Gene? Yeah, I am too. Um, I think that um, if we do move it forward, we're gonna ask Annie to do a lot of work between now and town meeting um, so that, you know, she, she and we can make a, the best case that we can for it at town meeting. Um, and I guess the other reason why I, there are two other reasons why I think we should move this now with the amendment as I suggested, rather than wait another year. One is, and this is what Ken said. I mean, we've talked about putting together a comprehensive housing package and then it was, let's wait for the housing production plan. And I just, I just think we need to put this out there for that and see how it goes and hopefully get a lot of timing support. And if not a majority, you know, if not necessary to pass town meeting, it will be a great educational opportunity, informational opportunity for everybody at town meeting for us as a redevelopment board and for other people in town. And the other reason is, you know, we don't expect there to be that many houses converted every year, but every year there are gonna be few more small houses torn down in, in the residential single family districts and replaced with large, large houses. And maybe if this passes this year, a few of those will be replaced with medium-sized two-family and duplexes rather than a large house. So I think that's the other reason to bring it forward now. You know, it's it's like the baby step in the right direction. Thank you, Jean. Um, and before we um, finish our discussion, I just want to clarify for the for the board and for the public here and, and for Annie that um, should we vote. Um, action on this to to move it forward that the outreach and the presentation of the petition will be the responsibility of Annie LaCourt, not the redevelopment board, because this is a um, warrant article inserted by Annie and 10 registered voters, not by the ARB. So I just again want to make that clear in terms of the expectations of the, the board, as well as of, of Annie. So Annie, you're... I'm very clear about that. Okay, I just wanna make sure we all are. Thank you. <laughs> Great, um, let's see. So uh, Melissa, any any final thoughts before we ask for a motion? Um, no, not at this point. Thank you. Steve? Uh, I, I'm just going to, I'm, I concur with Mr. Lau and Mr. Benson. Um, you know, and I, the other, you know, the other alternative is the, you know, essentially the status quo that we've seen for the C today and we've seen for the past few years. And I do think this is a better alternative. Thank you. Great. Uh, so uh, would one of the board members like to make a motion, perhaps Eugene, since you um, have amended the uh, article? So I, I yeah, thank you. So I will um, make a motion to recommend action on this article as amended tonight. Great, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right, we'll take a vote, starting with Ken. 
Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? No. Steve? Yes. And I'm a no. So we will uh, move forward with a recommendation of action on this article um, to move forward to town meeting. Thank you, Annie, for your work on this. Thank you guys. I thought I needed four votes. <laughs> nope, simple majority. Okay, great. All right, now the fun begins. Okay. All right, uh, so the next article will be Article 39, which is a zoning bylaw amendment for increased floor area, uh, the increased floor area ratio for mixed use structures. And this was um, inserted at the request of Zavid Pretzer and uh, 10 registered voters. Um, so there were a few changes made to this article uh, by the petitioner. Uh, between the public hearing and where we are today. Um, Jenny, if you could just top line those, those changes for us, we will then uh, move into the discussion. Hey, Rachel, I, the only changes were, I think, in response to the board's comment about uh, moving from four to what had been discussed at the meeting, which was maybe not higher than three. Um, and so that's what you see throughout this table. I, um, I, I, I think it's basically doubled, but not higher than three. Is that, would that be the better way to frame it? Okay, yeah, <laughs> all right, sorry. That everything is doubled from what it, what it is today, unless it was going to be higher than three, it just was stayed at three. Great, thank you very much. And that, that was the only change. Right, that that's it. the only one that I yeah. captured as well. Great. Um, so we had a lot of discussion at our prior meeting um, like to uh, continue this and hear the board's thoughts on um, moving this one forward as well. And we'll start with Ken. Um, I am in favor of this uh, article. I think uh, increasing the FAR does um, help encourage uh, more development in what we want in, in the business quarters for mixed use and it helps uh, support that. Uh, venture of having uh, ground floor uh, retail with some sort of lively interaction with the streetscape and uh, having uh, mix having housing above that, which which helps activate that. And I think you, you need a certain amount of density. I'm glad that the uh, petitioner uh, lowered the, the floor uh, FAR from four all the way across down to double to what was there. I think that is a much more a better uh, mixture for what's, what, what's required there. And we've seen some of the uh, existing ones where it was a little higher than 2.2, 2.3, or 2.5. But with the cost of construction and land these days, I think the threes are required in those areas. So I think this is a, a good, a good uh, change, and I support this. Great. Thank you, Ken. Gene. I support this too. I'm, I'm very glad that the uh, petitioner uh, changed the floor area ratio that he was supporting. You know, this board had talked about doing this ourselves um, and the petitioner just did this before we did it. We had recognized that the low FAR really put a damper on not only development along the commercial corridors, but the ability to include more affordable housing. You know, that when people can use this FAR, they will be required by the inclusionary bylaw to have affordable housing. So I think this is a win for affordable housing. It's a win for the tax, um, the tax of the town, the tax base, of the town. It's a win for activating the, the businesses and the streetscape. And I think it actually fits nicely with one of the other articles that we voted favorably on today, which had to do with the ground floor uses and uh, what they would look like and activating the streetscape. So I think this is a nice package with both of those. And, and you know, it's important to point out that it doesn't change the height limitations. There are still height limitations 
in each one of these districts. So we're not going to get any tall buildings or skyscrapers or not even a six story building. And um, there are still going to be the same requirements for setbacks and the like um, that there are before. So um, I think this is just the way that we need to go ahead with uh, our commercial districts. And again, it's just basically for the commercial districts. So that's, yes, I think it's good. Great, thank you, Jean. Melissa. Yes, um, I'm a little curious to hear from my fellow board members about kind of how this um, works with the analysis of use and a little bit more kind of design review because I feel like, you know, on the heels of the self storage down Dudley Street where they're using maximizing an FAR. Um, so we have a five story building without step backs. Um, and now it's kind of a low, in my opinion, kind of a low value, probably empirically so, but um, a low value commercial use. Um, if they're, given that this was a citizen petition, like has there been enough analysis that this, that we've reviewed the uses and I'm still a little kind of uneasy without understanding if we're doing the right thing without some step backs on this and, context and I'd like to hear from my fellow board members on that. Sure I'll um, keep going to Steve and we'll go back around again but I will note that um, this is a little bit different since it's not the industrial use um, zone it is the um, for mixed use for example there are um, setbacks required that are already in the zoning bylaw that would um, be, be applied um, that with, with this change in FAR, well, even without the change in FAR, they're required. Um, but go ahead, uh, Steve. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, Mix Pretzer um, making these refinements. I think it's more incremental and it still retains, you know, some of the distinction that the bylaw previously had for the different districts. Um, I think there's uh, at least one of the master plan recommendations that uh, would you know, be addressed would be furthered by this article, um, namely promoting the development of higher value mixed use buildings by providing redevelopment incentives. And I, I think there's, you know, we put added mixed use in 2016. Um, primarily, that was, you know, one of the recommendations of the master plan. I, I think we did put our that I think the the effort to you know, set up the initial dimensional regulations was, you know, put we put our best fo foot forward, um, but I, I think the, the FAR just turned out to be a little bit low. Um, and I think this is a targeted change. We're just, you know, working with, we're working with one dimensional aspect. And um, I think it will be at least, you know, easier for, town meeting to get their head around then, you know, perhaps some of the more elaborate proposals that have um, have come forward. Um, so I, I, I feel, I, I think this is a good step forward. Great, thank you, Steve. And I appreciate Steve, the very simple way that you approach this as well too, in terms of identifying that we put our best foot forward with creating the mixed use, um, regulations in 2016 and the FAR turned out to be too low to actually do what the um, mixed use um, section of the bylaw in, intended. And um, this is this is a, a good, especially with the with the change that the petitioner um, made, I think I appreciate that that they were so um, uh, that they took the recommendations of the board and, and introduced them in, in this change. Um, and I'm also supportive of of this change. Uh, I'll go back through. I know that um, Melissa um, had some questions and was looking to see if anyone from the board um, wanted to uh, further discuss uh, whether there was a need for additional analysis. And I'll start with um, Ken. Uh, well, hopefully this answers Melissa's questions a little bit. Um, this doesn't, uh, this change here 
is increasing the FAR only. It's not uh, affecting the setbacks. It's not affecting, um, um, I don't know, um, the height limitations and all that stuff. So it, it still falls within all that stuff that we had determined earlier uh, when we approved the mixed use. Um, I think it, what Steve said earlier was 100% correct. Um, we just did not have enough FAR to support what we had approved in 16 with the mixed use. I think this is a good step forward. Um, like Jean said, we're, we, I think we were considering this a while back and we had looked at uh, increasing the FAR, FAR so we can, uh, as one of the things that we missed uh, last time around. So I don't know, does that answer your question or not, Melissa, or not? Melissa, if you want to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank so, yeah. So I understand in terms of, you know, making a project feasible, it needs enough square footage. And that generally comes from the FAR, right? Um, we have the height limitation. In each of these districts, remind me, is it the same height or is it very still? I think it's varied, uh, believe, I believe, depending on uh, where, it, where it's at. And um, and I think the setbacks are a little different too, depending on where it is and what's next to it. So because of, let's give an example of Mass Ave, um, there might be business districts, but adjacent to it, there are our zones and there's other zones right. that, that vary that, that influences that. Uh, uh -huh. So it, 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 I can't give you a straight answer saying it's all the same. It's going to vary. It's just uh, depending on what it, what's next to it or what is to it. Um, yeah. But this is something that we were, we were supposed to do and we didn't get around to it. And this, this position had got ahead of us, but we, we were looking at these numbers earlier. Then could I ask why didn't staff or the ARB put this forward? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I think we ran out of time. We we're busy doing other things. I think we would we would have gotten around to it. I know it was uh, one. Of, this was one of our uh, things we talked about at our retreat. Uh, we talked about it at the beginning of the year. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I think I think the reason I thanks Ken. Um, I have more pause is, you know, kind of, yes, it is in the industrial zone, kind of the most recent project that's on my mind, but, you know, the fact that these business districts and, you know, Mass Ave is essentially kind of Arlington's living room and the care and conscientiousness that goes into the redeveloped projects, you know, we don't have an architect on staff as a retainer, as far as I know. I mean, I know you guys are skilled architects, but I don't understand like some of our design review process seems, you know, it's under the the environmental review process, but not necessarily design review process. So I'm just trying to make sure when, you know, redeveloped projects come through, you know, do have we incorporated enough kind of like, other mechanisms to ensure that this, these developments, taller, bigger, um, are well designed. That's well, part of our responsibility. But as, beyond as, what I'm saying board. is in other communities, I've seen um, an architect on, on like a retained architect to review kind of urban design and context. I mean, I know that's part of this board, but I'm trying to get an additional layer. And I'm wondering if we've considered that. And just in the context of you know, this coming again as a citizen's petition, I'm wondering if we've done all the due diligence um, that we should be doing as we move move this forward. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Yep, sure. Uh, um, can I answer that a little bit, sure, Melissa? With, uh, and it's just kind of a uh, off to the side. It's not really. Let's say uh, if you have a uh, a project down in Boston that's a lot larger, okay? Uh, generally, a developer will hire uh, a more expensive architect, or more experienced architect, because there's more wiggle room and the value of the project is much larger and it's, it's so forth. Whereas you are doing something uh, something on the side uh, in a little small town somewhere where there was 
not as much wiggle room and not as not as much. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to say it in a nice way, but enough enough capital where you can hire. So you generally, or where there's more risk, you hire someone that's not as, not as experienced, maybe not as uh, caring, and you get less quality designs. So I think by having uh, something's a little more stable and a little more a little larger, people would say, "Oh, well, this is if we put up a nice product, they all approve it," and so there's more leadway that way. I'm not sure if I'm making enough sense here. You, know, you want to help me out here a little, Rachel? Um, You're um, speaking to the overall, this creates more opportunity in the projects, which creates a, which creates um, space for a different level of developer and architect partner to in, engage given the, the um, the increased opportunity for, for scale, which again was the intent of the mixed use bylaw in the first place. Is that fair, Ken? Yes. Okay. Uh, Jean, I'll, I'll move on to, to you next. Um, again, we'll just finish up this, this discussion, see if there are any other um, points that, that we would like to, to raise before um, looking for a motion. Yeah, in, in answer to Melissa's question about the height limitations, it depends on which one of the business districts and it depends on the size of the building. The smaller buildings can have a higher story. So the maximum is five stories in some of the districts and for some of them and others it's four or three. So again, it depends on which district and the size. And this only is for mixed use projects. So clearly this wouldn't affect um, somebody trying to put in, you know, a self storage facility here because it's not mixed use aside from, I don't think it's allowable use anyhow. The, I guess two other things to point out is that, well, three other things. One is, you know, during the time I've been on the board, the architects on the board have done a great job in sometimes sending developers back to the drawing board and saying, look, this is just not gonna work here at this location. And so I think we have a pretty good track record about doing that. I can't take credit because I'm not, you know, architect or design person, but the people who are have done that, I think pretty well. Um, hopefully, there'll be something funded this year. I think it was just approved by the finance committee so that we can do significant design guidelines for commercial buildings. So by the time this is in place or soon thereafter, hopefully we will have design guidelines that, um, that if, you know, the builders can use and that we can point to, which I think will be helpful. And there are some design guidelines now as you know, the things the thing we passed earlier with uh, facades, you know, there is a requirement for step backs on the fourth floor, things like that. So I think some of those are there. I think we had decided this was something to do. Thank you, Jean. Um, and I'll just also point out that I know how hard the department works together with all of the applicants as well before these applications even get to us. I think you know, when we read through the memos, you can you can tell that they've already gone through several iterations and sometimes they detail how they've gotten to the point where they are today. So um, I, I just want to, um, again, acknowledge and recognize the, the, the work that the de department does even before the um, we see the, the projects that, that we see today. Um, Steve, I'll turn it over to you for any additional comments. Yeah, in terms of um, other constraints on sort of the building envelope, um, as Mr. Benson mentioned, it's three, four, or five uh, stories based on the lot size or district. Uh, there is also, you know, a height buffer zone, which depends on the parcel's proximity to an R one to an R one or R two district. Um, you know, and of course, there's you know the rest of the other dimensional regulations. Um, Yeah, I, 
think uh, nothing further from me, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. I think that at this point, I'd like to see if there is um, a motion. So we did not make any changes, recommend any changes or make any uh, amendments this evening. Is there um, a motion to um, recommend action on Article 39, increased floor area ratio? I'd like the motion to recommend action. There a second. I'll second. We'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? No. Uh, Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes. So we will uh, recommend action for Article 39, zoning bylaw amendment for increased floor area ratio for mixed use structures. And as a reminder, this was inserted at the request of um, David Pretzer and 10 registered voters, and they will be responsible for um, creating the outreach and um, presentation for the uh, for town meeting. All right, we will now move to, sorry, let me pull my agenda back up here. Article 40, which is the zoning map amendment uh, for expanded business districts. And Jenny, I will see, I don't believe there were any changes on this. No, nothing has changed okay. at all on this particular article or Great. proposed amendment and map change. Great, thank you. Uh, so we'll start with Ken. Um, I'm kind of torn on this one here. Um, I'm on the fence. I like to see what my rest of the board members to say, but I'm very forward and and want to uh, to uh, continue uh, the zoning along Mass Ave to be more continuous. It's right now it's sort of spot zoned all over the place. It was zoned to whatever was there at the time, and I think we need to step back and not just look at these four parcels, but look at the whole. Uh, Mass Ave, I'll take a playbook out of Melissa here and say, hey, let's go and look at this whole thing here and understand what we want to do with the whole Mass Ave because right now it's, it's it ranges anywhere from R to a B4 or whatever it does. And I think we need to look at it holistically. And I don't know. Uh, and then make these, uh, and then make changes, not just a little spot here, a little spot there. Um, I'm not um, big into spot zoning. Thank you, Ken. Jean? I'm torn on this too, for the reasons Ken stated, and for um, a couple of other reasons. You know, um, I think one of the owners of one of the properties said this was a good idea. And I think one or two or more of the others said it was not. And I'm not sure they really, um, and they didn't say why. They didn't think it was a good idea because it should have no immediate impact um, on their property. But in the long run, if they ever decided to sell, they might actually be better off. So. You know, it's not clear why they were opposed to it and they didn't really, I think, give us good information. The, the other part I'm not sure about, and this is a little bit in what Ken had to say, you know, I'm, I'm not automatically opposed to apartment buildings on Mass Ave mixed in with um, um, commercial spaces. So I'm not sure about the parcel that's current zoning R5. So um, like to hear what other people say about that. And again, you know, I'm mixed too because, you know, do we just go ahead with this very small area or do we do a more comprehensive look? This is another thing that, you know, the board has talked about in the past, not just these few properties, but lots of properties. We're taking a whole look at what's a more rational zoning for Mass Ave, because as we've all come to learn, these are zoned to whatever the building happened to be, basically in 1970, what, four or five, 
when the town rezoned, which is sort of the opposite of what you do if you were really looking at this and try to figure out a plan for development of your commercial corridor. So um, yeah, that's I'm mixed. Interested to hear what other people have to say. Thank you, Jean. Melissa? Um, yeah, no, I appreciate kind of the effort that the applicant you know, kind of brought forward in trying to offer some kind of unifying zone here through this area. Um, but the way I'm thinking about it right now is that, you know, you know, mixed use can come not only in vertical mixed use, but it can come in like a horizontal side by side mixed use throughout a corridor. You know, if we're looking at 15 minute cities, you can have apartment buildings, you can have some commercial um, adjacent to it. And it doesn't have to be all on the one you know, lot, whether it's mixed use or for um, trying to keep, create a whole you know, corridor of commercial. It might sound a little incongruent, you know, kind of given my background is economic development. And I think I want to kind of provide some context. I mean, I think, um, you know, my caution on moving forward on FAR, my caution on some of this is that you know, we need to look at, you know, we haven't talked a little bit more about form-based zoning. We haven't talked about, you know, the parking pieces. There are other pieces that kind of play into a feasible redevelopment and a quality redevelopment at that. Um, and so as I look at this, I'm, you know, again, in my experience, in my work, I work directly with property owners and say, what is it going to take for you to do X, Y, Z, which is, you know, aligned with a community goal. And so, you know, is it a zoning change? Is it something else, you know, or, you know, given the circumstances, maybe there's no intention for change for a long time. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking through this and I'm trying to understand, you know, although it kind of goes in with our goals, you know, what is a bigger message we're sending as we bring these things to town meeting? You know, are we doing a helter skelter piecemeal thing? Or are we trying to kind of say, hey, this is our, our you know, this is us going forward. This is, you know, the ARB going forward. So I'm, I'm a little kind of on the fence with that. And that's my thinking at this time. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Steve. Yeah, there's, it is a small district, um, but I do think you know the pro the the proposed parcel rezoning makes sense. Um, I I had to think a lot about the comments from the property owners, um, and I'm still a little you know, on, on the fence about that. I'd I'd feel better if we had gotten more letters of support. Um, I, you know, one of the things if we as a board put forward a you know a larger um you know looking at looking at mass ab which i i think we do need to do and whether or not we support this or not um i think we still will need to to look at mass ab um you know, i i think there you know some of the hesitation that we've encountered here is also what we're you know, we'll we'll encounter that in other parts of town. Um, yeah. So I'm. Yeah. Like as 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 with as my other colleagues have said, I'm somewhat torn. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So um, I'd have a really hard time supporting this, given how torn <laughs> every everybody is on this I think that you know changing the zoning map is not something that any of us take lightly and I think that um, what I'm hearing from everybody again as we look towards trying to find some consensus here is that um, a more comprehensive view of this seems to be um, the desire of the redevelopment board um, can I I take your note about um, not wanting to engage in spot zoning very, very seriously. And I, and I think that obviously with the MBTA communities, 
PACE coming up, there is going to be a, you know, a zoning review that we'll need to do as, as part of that, um, which may make the timing right for us to look at a larger, um, larger zoning uh, review at, at that time. Um, so I'll run through again, because we, we, we were torn as to whether to, to move this forward and, and see if anyone has gained any clarity from this discussion. Um, so that we can move forward with a, a, a vote of uh, action or no action. And we'll start again with you, Ken. Well, I want to start by saying thanks to James for bringing this forward and, and bringing up some of these uh, ideas. Uh, it's much appreciative. Uh, but hearing uh, the rest of my board members, I'm probably not going to uh, vote in favor of this. Thank you, Ken. Jean? I'll second what Ken had to say, and, and just want to add that Melissa said better than I had said, which was, you know, I'm not sure we want to prohibit larger apartment buildings because there's some benefit to have having a mix on Mass Ave. You know, so if we were to have done this ourselves, we might have come up with a different conclusion on which one of these to change and to what to change them and whether we should have done or would do some other parts of the avenue at the same time. So yeah, I'm thinking we're not ready to go here yet. Thank you, Jean. Melissa? Um, yeah, I'm not inclined at this point to go forward. Thank you, Melissa. Steve? Yeah, I mean, the apartments, I, I think the apartment is a, is a separate issue because I believe that is an allowed use in the B district. Um, I think the B district is the only parcel, is, are the only parcels in town that are large enough to actually build, meet the uh, lot requirements for an apartment, but neither here nor there. Um, I really appreciate um, Mr. Fleming for bringing this forward. Um, and I hope that we as a board um, will be willing to work on this, um, you know, hopefully in the next year or so. Great. Thank you, Steve. All right. Uh, is there, uh, so what I'm hearing is consensus. Is there a motion to um, recommend uh, no action on Article 41, or excuse me, Article 40? Um, related to expanded business districts uh, on the table. Yes, motion to recommend no action. Is there a second? I'll second them. Take a vote, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will... Uh, we will recommend no action for uh, Article 40. We'll now move to Article 41, which is the zoning bylaw amendment for apartment parking minimums. Um, I do not believe that there were any changes as a result of the public comment. Jenny's checking her head no. No changes. Great. Um, so let's go ahead and move right into the discussion. And we'll start with Jean. I, I favor this and I have two wording changes. In the table, the word units, I think should be singular unit. Maybe other people disagree, but look to me that should be yep. unit. And afterward, after the, in the residential uses, use line, apartment building should read apartment building except for public housing for the elderly. Oh because they're in the next block down. And, and as we discussed before about um, parking, these are the areas that have good access to public transportation. Um, and um, I guess studies are. have shown that um, very good. One space per dwelling unit is all that. Well, I mean, it's fine. Okay. Uh, uh, so, sorry, Jean, if you wouldn't mind for a second. I believe that uh, there's someone, Robin Bergman, if you could please mute yourself. Thank you. 
Sorry, Gene, if you could go ahead. So, yeah, and, and the studies which were discussed um, when we had the public hearing on this showed that uh, one space per dwelling unit is, is more than adequate in these areas, and it does allow um, the possibility of more apartments um, to be built, and more apartments means more affordable units under the inclusionary zoning bylaw. And, you know, there were some comments that we're changing the rules for public housing for the elderly, and we're not. All it did was move around where the requirements are, but the requirements for public housing for the elderly are not proposed to be changed here. It's only the parking for um, apartment buildings to make them consistent with the parking for single family, two family, and three family dwelling. So I support this. Great, thank you, Gene. Ken? I also support this um, with, uh, with all Gene's um, comments. And I believe uh, this is uh, the number of, uh, of parking requirements was also has been a hindrance on moving forward to uh, developing mixed use projects because of uh, the lots are so small along Mass Ave that you ran out of space for parking and then retail. And this gives an opportunity to have a little more retail on the ground floor, which it activates the streetscape we're trying to do it along with the master plan. So I think this is uh, a, a good step for a balanced approach at the whole thing. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, and before I move to the next member of the board, I'll just note that um, for James Fleming that we will, after I have all of the board members speak, we'll come back to you with regard to your acceptance or, um, or not of the proposed changes that uh, Jean has suggested. Uh, so we'll now go to Melissa. Um, I, I support this how it, in terms of you know reducing the parking, so great. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Steve, I'm supportive. Um, I think this uh, goes in the general direction of two of the master plan recommendations. Uh, one being to establish parking ratios that reflect the actual actual need for parking, and the second being to modify parking requirements to encourage multifamily housing and mixed use development in commercial areas. Now, I was on the Zoning Board of Appeals while we were doing the um, comprehensive permit hearings for 1165R in Mass Ave, which wound up at you know, requiring one space per dwelling. And we spent a lot of time discussing whether that would be a sufficient amount of parking for an apartment building. And you know, the applicants came in with their, uh, you know, their estimates, and then we had a set a peer review engineer uh, an engineering firm to act as peer, peer reviewers who look who you know also went over them and we ended up coming down on the side of one pay, space per unit being sufficient um and I, I i'm comfortable with that and also comfortable because it is what we require for single two and three family homes so i am supportive great thank you steve um i too am supportive of this for uh the reasons already stated by my colleagues, um, specifically with the consistency, uh, as Steve was just mentioning, with uh, single family, two family, and three family homes. Um, so at this time, I will check and see if James Fleming, uh, yes, James, I see that you're here with us this evening. Um, if you could unmute yourself and um, let us know if you have any concerns with the um, highlighted uh, changes to the wording as uh, has been suggested, or if that would be acceptable to you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you, James. Awesome. And I'm sorry, James, if you could just introduce yourself as well. First, last name and address. Good reminder. I was definitely going to forget. Uh, James Fleming, um, Oxford Street. Um, uh, I So I guess is the reason to put except for public housing, is that because public housing for the elderly is considered an apartment building? Gene is nodding his head yes. Okay. Would it make more sense maybe to put that down in the second entry instead? So, so basically, instead of adding it to the top row, 
we just say one space per dwelling unit and one space per five units of public housing for the elderly in the second row. Does that make sense? I, I think the way it is with these exceptions is better because there's one line for everything except public housing, second line for public housing for the elderly. Okay, that's fine. I think yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 we're, we're wordsmithing at this point. I, I'm okay with the change. Okay, thank you, James. And thank you for submitting uh, this one article. Uh, let's see, so I'll go back through the, um, the board members one more time to see if there's any additional comment before we take a motion. So uh, starting with Ken. Oh, no additional comments. Dean? No comments. Melissa? No comment. Steve? No further comments, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, so is there a motion to recommend action on Article 41 as amended? Motion to recommend action. I'll second. Thank you. I'll take a vote with Kim. Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will recommend action on Article 41, apartment parking minimums. We'll now move to Article 42, the zoning by law amendment for open space uses. And we had discussion, but I don't believe that there are any changes, Jenny, uh, for this. No changes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we'll start the discussion with Ken. Uh, I have no, no changes, no questions, and I'm supportive of this article. Great, thank you. Jean? I'm supportive too, because as we learned last time, every one of these will still need a permit or an approval from somewhere else in the town. And so there doesn't seem any need for them to get an approval or permit somewhere else and also get a zoning bylaw approval. I do have a wording suggestion though. Okay. In the first, third and fourth lines, I don't see the need for the words that say um, for or not for profit, because if you take them out, it just means the same thing. You know, they're just like surplus to take yeah. out the words for or not for profit. So I take them out of lines one, three, and four. Can I just ask Jenny if uh, you see any reason for uh, keeping those in? I, I, this is a, uh, this is in other parts of uses in our bylaw for one and two, this is actually one of the points of the Parks and Rec Commission is that currently we actually only allow nonprofit, but we don't allow for-profit according to our zoning bylaw. So, okay. but that, that's the reason for the addition. I, I think actually James might be best positioned to answer further because this is, again, he's adding these amendments, but that is my understanding. And especially having worked on this through the pandemic um, and trying to get things permitted, this was something that came up pretty frequently in those conversations, which we were able to relax during the pandemic and of course, uh, we would like to keep it. To keep it would mean to add this language. So let me just say in those three, if you had the words in for or not for profit or remove them, it would mean exactly the same thing. Um, may I add something to this? Sure, Melissa. Yep, I saw you had your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, Jean, just in a practical sense, because we I've been part of um, a lot of regional discussions on um, implementation of these concepts. Um, I think it's better to be explicit um, for for the sake. I know in terms of being concise, it might be cleaner to just remove it. But for this type, because it's unusual and for what you're putting forward, it's better to be explicit. Okay, I'll withdraw my suggestion. Okay, thank you, Jean. Any other comments? Jean, any other comments? No. Okay, thank you. Melissa? Uh, no comments, um, supportive of this. Great, and thank you for the clarification. Uh, Steve? I am supportive. I think this is essentially taking some of the temporary outdoor uses we allowed during the pandemic and just um, making them more permanent. And I think that's a good thing. Thank you. 
Great, thank you, Steve. I agree. I think that um, taking away the, the red tape, um, since there is already a, um, a permit correct granting authority uh, for this type of use, uh, taking away the second uh, and the red tape is uh, something that I would favor. Uh, so I will ask uh, James Fleming again, if you could uh, introduce yourself and unmute um, and let us know. Actually, you know what? We didn't make that amendment. So yeah, I'll set never mind. off the hook. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. So I think at this point, I will ask the uh, board members if there is a motion to recommend action for uh, uh, Article 42. Um, I motion to recommend the action for Article 42. Thank you, Melissa. Second. Thank you, Ken. I uh, will take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm the yes as well. So we will recommend action on Article 42. We'll move to Article 43, which is a zoning bylaw amendment for zoning map amendment requirements. This was also inserted uh, by the request of James Fleming and 10 registered voters. I don't believe that there were any changes during our um, public there, hearing. There, there were? There were not during the hearing, but there were after. Oh, um, great. Did you have uh, a some, first? Yeah, some correspondence uh, with uh, James and I think Jean. Um, maybe Jean, do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, just that there was some correspondence about how to word the, the uh, sentence that starts with the Department of Planning and Community Development. And that's um, where we landed so that the initial petition goes to the owners and immediate abutters. Um, one of the things that came up during the public hearing about that was what about the people who are directly opposite on any public or private way or street? And since there has to be a second notice at the Department of Planning, or there is a second notice Department of Planning and Human Development does, we still thought it was just appropriate to put in here exactly what that was so people would understand. It goes to the petitioner, the owners of the land, abutters, owners of land directly across any public or private street and abutters of abutters within 300 feet. So that tracks language in the state zoning code. Great, thank you, Jean. <clears throat> uh, did you have any other uh, comments or um, discussion around support or uh, thoughts about no action for this article? I, I just, oh, you're asking me? I just yeah. think this provides necessary clarity and and to the, to the zoning bylaw, which is helpful when there's a potential, when a potential change to the zoning map is filed. Great, thank you. Ken. Uh, yes, I am also supportive of this. I think this clarifies it and makes it uh, easier uh, to uh, who gets notified, who doesn't. Great, thank you. Melissa. Um, no further comment, I think I'm supportive of this. Great, thank you. Steve. Uh, I'm supportive. Uh, during the hearings, I uh, may have been the director who said this, but it may have been someone else. But, you know, if the bylaw is telling us to do something, it should be clear on what it's telling us to do. And I hope this, um, you know, adds some clarity. So, yes, I'm supportive. Great. Thank you, Steve. And I am as well. Um, I appreciate, um, Jean, you working together um, with, with Jenny and um, James Fleming on the uh, reworded uh, article language, so thank you. Uh, so at this time, is there a motion to um, recommend action for the uh, for Article 43? Motion um, to recommend action. Sorry, Jean, go ahead. No, no, Ken, did I will second Ken's motion. Thank you both. Uh, we'll take a vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you all. We will recommend action for Article 43. And again, this was inserted request of James Fleming. Let's 
see the um, next article is Article 44 for restaurant uses, which was also in sort of the request of James Fleming. Um, Jenny, were there any changes following the um, discussion? There were not any changes following the discussion. Great, thank you. Uh, so we'll start with Ken. Uh, this one here, um, I think I'm on the fence on too, because I think um, upping the square footage to a larger uh, restaurant, uh, it, it impacts the neighborhood uh, more. And I think it should go under um, a special permit and review with the neighbors, uh, having some input too. Uh, so I don't know. I, I would like to see what the rest of my, uh, my board members think. Uh, you know, it was always at that 2000 mark where it was a small, small enough place that didn't make that much of an impact. But once you start getting into larger restaurants with uh, grease, uh, grease traps and dumpsters and parking and stuff like that, I don't know. I'm not sure what the correct number, the correct number is. Uh, but I think th uh, this is to help um, streamline the, the permitting process. And I'm not not sure what, you know, is it 3,000, 4,000, or, or, is it, or is it right at 2,000? So that's where I'm at right now. Thank you, Ken. Gene? Yeah, I, I, at the public hearing, expressed my concern about this proposal and um, felt that the example that was given for why should we should do this was an example about why we shouldn't do this, that, um, there needs to be a line drawn somewhere. The line's been drawn at 2,000 square feet, and it seems to have worked. We've had larger and smaller restaurants come and go um, in town at, at that number. And um, Kim points out a lot of reasons why larger restaurants need um, more review. So maybe it could be higher than 2,000. I don't see any justification for 4,000 or anywhere near 4,000. The, the other thing that I had mentioned um, last time was that if we had um, site design review, that would be an alternative, but we don't have that. And until we have it, I think for the reasons Kim stated, um, we need to continue um, the special permits for restaurants greater than 2,000 square feet. So I'm not in favor of this article. Thank you, Jean. Melissa. Um, well, in general, I actually feel supportive. I think this is a supportive action for restaurant and hospitality in Arlington. I don't see 4,000 square feet being excessive. Um, I think even, you know, on the site where you're not your average Joe's and then the desire for Chase Bank wanted to go in was about 4,000 square feet. Um, and I don't see that being egregious in terms of its impact in the neighborhood. I think we've been doing better with parking and parking management um, in the town and, you know, with meters, with enforcement. Um, and so I would support this. Thank you, Melissa. Steve. Uh, just, uh, I, I do have a question. If um, even without a special permit, when a someone wants to open a restaurant, they do need to get permits from the Board of Health, at least with respect to things like dumpster placement and that sort of thing? Correct. Jenny, can you further clarify? Board of Health, the select board. Uh, the yes, yes. Inspectional services. I mean, mm -hmm. there's still other permitting entities. Yeah, I, I think I'm with Melissa on this one. Um, I, I don't think this is terribly large. Um, one of the other elements um, that, or one of the, one of the yeah, I, 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 I'll just say that I, I, I agree with um, Ms. Gentakalos on this one. So I'm supportive. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, let's see, I will see if there are any other, any other discussion. Uh, any other questions from any of the board members? 
All right. Uh, see. Oh, well, Rachel, what's your opinion? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have my opinion. <laughs> I um, I also feel that to me the number seems a bit arbitrary. Um, again, I um, to I think the point that Ken and 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 Jean made. You could almost pick pick any number out, but I don't think that the petitioner has specifically identified why four thousand is is the right number. So if we we're going to make a change, I would I would want to um, better understand why. I'll go back to Ken. Any any further thoughts or questions? No, you didn't help. <laughs> I'm still on the fence. Um, I I mean I'd like go to ahead, add Nelson. to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, of all the industries, I know restaurants are the most regulated industry, as you know, you know, Jenny was saying, between Board of Health State and several of these other agencies that have to approve kind of food plans and moving forward. I mean, I think, you know, 4,000 square feet, if we mean what we say about activation and trying to create, you know, this kind of environment that becomes more of a destination over time through Mass Ave. I mean, I think this is a supportive action in that that very classic kind of economic development, you know, policy on a, a community level. Um, I think the oversight on trash cans and stuff like that, I mean, I think that's kind of a little controlling. And I think we could kind of give that and trust that, you know, our staff would be on top of that. What about traffic, Melissa? I mean, there, I, in my opinion, I mean, I think when there are <laughs> a lonely street with no cars, no one wants to be there. When it's like, it's harder actually to park and get around, it sounds a little crazy. I know there's kind of the dynamics of like people will turn away, but I think we, we've managed parking. We've have meters now we have you know technology in those meters we've done a better in terms of locating some of the parking off-site into some of the lots um and so i think and if we're trying to encourage walkability if we look around the the density of the corridor where residents would you know where restaurants would be allowed i think kind of in terms of the density of residents just like down the quarter, I think we'd find that, you know, it's still and could encourage that walkability. And so I feel like there's, you know, this is kind of, to me, it seems pretty small in, in the big scheme of things. I mean, we're putting some art, we're letting um, some of the analysis on the FAR on development be proposed. Um, by a citizen petition without further analysis, um, but on a 4,000 square foot restaurant, I think we could consider allowing that by right. So I'll, I'll just add to, the, to that. Um, if I were going to support this at all, I would want it to be in alignment with the retail size, which is 3,000 square feet. Again, I just feel like 4,000 is completely arbitrary. And um, I think that one of the reasons why we have these numbers um, here is so that we can review facade activation. You know, there, there are a number of other items that I think are important for us to review, especially when you get to some of those larger square footage items, because we are able then to um, you know, ensure that windows are activated or perhaps fold. I mean, there, there are lots of different ways that we can work with um, an applicant when they are taking a larger square footage um, parcel within the town. So um, again, if I were to look at this in terms of how to make this less arbitrary, I would ask that it be the restaurants become in alignment with the retail uh, square footage requirements. Richard, were you good? are you going to ask asking that of James? Is he willing to change it to three thousand or? I'd want us to discuss that first, and then yes, we could certainly. If, if others feel that that is um, something that they'd like to see, or if they'd prefer the four thousand, or <laughs> again, there's there's no support for that. Um, I, I'd want us to discuss that, and then we can ask James. That gets me off the fence. Okay. Um, can I'd like to say a couple of things before we ask James? Sure. One is. Um, James did not present any information that the current levels are an impediment for any restaurant coming to town. 
and before the pandemic, we were known for restaurants of various sizes and types. Um, the two, the you know, the I think five years I've been on the board, I can recall two restaurants that came before us for special permits, and we asked them for minor changes and approved them relatively quickly. So um, I don't think we've been an impediment. I think we've helped. And there's been no evidence presented that this has really been an impediment other than, oh, maybe somebody wouldn't do it, you know, because of having to go get a special permit. So yeah, I'm really not convinced that there's a case made to change this in any way. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Melissa. Um, I mean, I would agree with Rachel in that, um, you know, as much as the number is kind of arbitrary, given what I've seen, again, in my experience, um, they tend to be smaller restaurants. I mean, the larger corporate ones, you know, seat many more and need a much larger footprint for some of the larger, more, I would say, impactful restaurants. Um, so I could see um, the alignment with the retail piece at 3,000 makes sense. You have some, if that's by right currently, the retail, and then you have a restaurant that is the same square footage, I would say that would be okay. Thank you, Melissa. Steve? Uh, I I would also I would be fine with with um, aligning with retail. Um, there's one other one other thing that um, is actually in the main motion that we haven't mentioned, uh, which is that for the B4 district we're we're adding we're adding a Y. Um, I I think that's a little bit significant. The B4 district is our vehicular oriented business district. I think that's what it's called, but basically it's you know there's the district's definition talks about, you know, having auto repair facilities and filling stations and body shops and, you know, saying that as these businesses go out of, out of, as these businesses turn over or, you know, stop operating, um, the bylaw would like something not automotive to go into those districts. Um, but, you know, the restaurant use under, you know, under the, that, that first restaurant line was never, uh, was not allowed. Um, and I am, I am glad that it would, you know, to see the why as part of that main motion. Um, but I, yeah, I'm fine with 3,000 feet. I, I think that would be fine. Great. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for that, um, for pointing that out. I think that's an important call out as well for, for everybody. Um, so at, at this time, I think I'd like to ask James um, as to whether or not uh, you would be amenable to um, a change from 4,000 square feet to 3,000 to align with the requirements for uh, for retail uh, retail use. I mean, I guess so, but the 3,000 for retail is also an arbitrary number, and the 2,000 that is there now is arbitrary as well. And the only reason we're not talking about them that way is that they've been there for decades at this point. So I will reluctantly accept 3,000, but I would challenge you that 4,000 and 3,000, no matter what the number you pick, they're still arbitrary. Thank you, James. Uh, further discussion, I'll start with, um, with Ken. No, I'm, I'm all set. Okay, Gene? Um, I think 3,000 is better than 4,000. I'm still going to vote no on it. And, um, they're not arbitrary. Sometimes you have to pick a number and you have to do the best that you can to determine where the number should be. And sometimes history, not always, but sometimes history is a good guide to whether the number you chose works or not and becomes no longer arbitrary when it seems to be working fine. Thank you, Jean. Melissa. Um, I have no further comment. Thank you, uh, Steve. Nothing further from me, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, so is there a uh, motion 
to recommend uh, action on article, and then could you scroll up? I'm trying to get back to my thing here. Article 44, uh, restaurant uses as amended. I'm, I move to make a support, uh, an action. Recommend action. Yeah. Recommend action, thank you. Thank on you. article, what number are we? Article 44 as amended. 44 as amended, thank you. Thank you, is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? No. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will recommend action for Article 44 as amended. All right, um, and our next article is Article 45, which is a zoning bylaw amendment uh, related to appeals. And uh, this was inserted at the request of uh, Sophie Neazzo um, and 10 registered voters. And Jenny, I know that we had quite a bit of discussion uh, did the petitioner make any changes uh, following the public hearing? Um, I think Jane is going to talk about a potential change that he discussed with uh, the petitioner, but we did also have the opportunity to have a discussion with town council, um, and I wanted to share that with the board. Great. If that's possible. Yes, thank um, you. So regarding the appeals, this um, whole discussion, Doug provided three concerns about the article um, as follows. The first one was that, and we talked about this, and I think it was in the memo originally, but that it's possibly the preemption by state law um, issue. Um, the second one that I think we also discussed either in the memo or during the hearing was that it's not consistent with the Town Manager Act. Um, individuals who have complaints with inspectional services department handling of any complaint can write to the town manager to request any sort of additional action. So that is something that can happen right now. And that is technically what the purpose of the town manager act is for, not to direct another body. And then further um, to uh, continue what the town council suggested, this puts the zoning board of appeals in a very difficult position because the appeal would not be an appeal of the building inspector's decision or interpretation of the zoning bylaw, but rather that the complainant disagrees with the building inspector's decision not to take civil action. So this is ultimately not a matter that the CBA has any authority over. Um, and that was, that was the nature of the discussion with town council. And I um, just wanna put that in the record and offer that that is the, the primary follow-up that I did, um, but again, there was further follow-up by Jean. Great, thank you so much, Jenny. Jean? Yep. So Jenny, can you put up the, the revised main motion, please? So while Jenny's looking for it, I'll just say the petitioner contacted me after the public hearing, maybe because I had the most concerns or expressed the most concerns and asked if we could work on coming up with an alternative, which is what we did, which Jenny's going to share pretty soon. And I just want to just walk you through it. Um, so, so in, in the original main motion, they would have amended 3.1.2B to say that, um, to require the building inspector to institute appropriate action or proceedings in the name of the town. But it, it seemed like you know, you can't ask the town to bring a lawsuit. Um, so they said, okay, let's not do that. 
And instead they put in the bolded language instead in um, three, which basically gives the building inspector um, a lot of time to um, take action. So what's the action? The building inspector has determined there's a violation. The building inspector has um, issued an order that says you person are in violation of the um, zoning bylaw. You must abate the violation by a certain amount of days, but then the person doesn't abate the violation. So the zoning, so the next step, if the town wanted to pursue it, would have to be to go to court um, against the person because they're not obeying the town's, the building inspector's order to abate. So this is what we, um, and so this basically just gives a way to get to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And this is what um, Jenny and I and the building inspector discussed with town council, not the original one, but this one. And Jenny, you know, accurately reported um, the town council's concerns about this. And I said to the town council, well, are you saying then that if the building inspector doesn't go to court because he's too busy, there's too much going on, you know, whatever the appropriate reason is that the person making the request doesn't have any remedy. And so, well, and the town council said basically two remedies, one, you know, the building inspector reports to um, the town manager. So you can go to the town manager and say, hey, town manager, this is going on, something needs to happen. And Doug didn't say this, but I will say, if they're not satisfied with what the town manager says in response or the response that they get thereafter, they can always go to the select board because the town manager reports to the select board so they can do that administratively or, you know, town council said they can sue um, in court against the violator for nuisance. The, one of the um, people who brought the article said, you know, there's this court case, which he allowed me to read, which he gave me to read, I should say, which says you can't sue somebody else for a zoning violation. So you just can't sue and say they're violating zoning, but you can sue if it amounts to a nuisance on your property. So, I mean, to me, telling somebody the only way you have to do is sue to go to court because the town's not suing to go to court. If you can't get any, any satisfaction within the town is not a great answer, but I think Doug pointed out the Board of Appeals doesn't have the authority, the Zoning Board of Appeals, to tell the building inspector or the town to bring a lawsuit. So. You know, the, it seems like the remedies are to go up the administrative ladder in town or to, um, and you know, try to get something done or to go to court yourself. So that's where it's left. Thank you for the clarification, Gene. Uh, so we'll start the discussion with Ken. Yeah, I'd like to ask one question to Gene. Uh, I'm not sure, or Jenny. Uh, the building inspector is hired and works under the state inspector. Am I not correct? As well as the town manager. Okay, so if the building inspector is not being not doing his job or not following regulations, then you step it up to the state inspector and and let him know that this is happening. There's no mention of this whatsoever here. Um, I'm a little concerned about that. And that usually, that's the, I agree with Gene, that's the next step, I believe. And then you can go to the town manager, uh, but I, I still think this, uh, uh, this is just repetitive and I'm not sure I agree with this at all right now, just the whole thing. Uh, I think, um, I don't know what happened with this person 
who may have an issue and the building inspector didn't follow through or, or didn't do, do something. But I think this is, uh, I think making a, a, this whole uh, article just for that reason is not there. And I'm not supportive of this uh, at all. I think this adds more, uh, I don't know, just because someone's ha unhappy with the outcome. Uh, I mean, was the was the town manager notified? What was the town manager's uh, position on what did happen there? Uh, I, did, I think there's so many other things. I, I kind of concur with uh, Doug that this just puts too much of a, a burden on the zoning uh, zoning board. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we'll go to uh, Melissa next. Um. I'm not inclined to support um, moving this forward. Um, I think Doug explained well um, the limitations, number one, and number two, it does feel like it's adding a level of litigation or opportunities for that don't, don't see it well and kind of articulated through Doug um, Town Council. So um, that's where I'm at. Thank you. Steve? So just to clarify, the what we're looking at on the screen is the revised main motion. That's my understanding, yes. Yeah. I can also take this down and put the original up if that would oh, be no, useful. No, 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 this is, this is better, okay. better to have, if, if the original's not in play anymore, better to have the one that is. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I th think I am inclined to agree with, um, agree with Melissa and you know if the you know if there is a it sounds like there is a remedy through the town manager act um and I I, I would be inter, would be concerned about introducing new avenues for litigation so thank you thank you Jean so a couple of things yeah, I, if, what Ken pointed out is, is sort of interesting that the building inspector reports to both the town manager and the state building inspector. Though what I don't know is whether the state building inspector can say something to the building inspector if what the building inspector is doing is not an interpretation of the building code, not um, an interpretation of the zoning bylaw, but just failing to have the town go to court. So I'm not clear that the state building inspector can come on down on a local building inspector on that. I just don't know. Um, in my conversations with, well, let me ask this. What would you think if, if the people who had brought this article had spoken to the town manager many times over the course of many months and nothing changed. Would that change your mind? Um, I'll, I mean, it doesn't change my mind, Jean. I, yeah, I, I would agree. I think that um, <laughs> introducing something that number one is, um, possibly not allowable in terms of process by state law. And that puts the ZBA in um, a position that um, where they don't actually have authority over the building inspector. This doesn't solve for what, what you just mentioned. Yeah, so I, I well, I'm not inclined to support it either. I, I think we have, you know, if we vote no action, what will go to town meeting, I think, is not this, but the original main motion. Am I right about that, Jenny? Correct. So if, you know, if, if the proponent of the article, you know, wants to put in a substitute motion at town meeting, they'll have to, you know, make that happen. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying I support this. I just wanted to lay out what happened and and you know the results of my conversations with the 
particle proponents. Thank you, Gene, and I, and I really do appreciate you taking the time to meet with everybody and to, to um, try and understand the, um, the, the impetus for, for the article and to craft something that, um, that, that better achieved their, their, their aim in terms of what the, um, the town bodies could, could support. So thank you for doing all that work. Um, any further discussion? I'll just run through, uh, Ken, Steve? Uh, nothing. Melissa? No. Jean? Yeah, I would just say, I wish I could support something for them, but based on the conversation with Doug and with the building inspector, I just don't think there's any way to amend the zoning bylaw to get what they want. Thank you. Um, okay, so at this time, uh, I will see if there is a um, motion to recommend no action for Article 45. Motion to recommend no action. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I will second that, Ken. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So we will recommend no action for Article 45. All right, so at this time we will return back to Article 30, uh, which we had tabled, uh, the article for uh, solar installation. Let's get back to that one, give me one second. And we will reopen discussion. Um, Jean is your... I, I, I didn't, I just looked for Shelly on the participant list and did not see her. Okay. So if we go to the next page, which is where we, I think, had the um, question. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, the question, I think, if you go, no, no, up a little more. Yeah, like that. The question really is whether we keep in A what has been deleted and get rid of that sentence that Jenny has that Jenny has um, highlighted in gray above, or whether we keep the gray sentence and get rid of and and delete what Jenny has deleted in yellow. I think those are our two options. Agreed. Um, so you know, Kin's point is. Look, if you keep the gray one, then somebody's, you know, is going to the board not knowing, let's say that they have, you know, that maybe 40% of their roof is covered with solar, could be solar, whether they need solar until they ask the board. Um, on the other hand, if somebody does have 40% of their roof that's solar ready, do we wanna say no? you know, that that's okay not to put on solar because they're not up at 50%. The, we um, borrowed liberally from the Watertown um, ordinance on this. The Watertown ordinance um, did not have the smaller percentage of the roof area in it. Instead, it had the part in A that's not highlighted in yellow. And when um, Shelley spoke to the Watertown uh, staff person, you know, he said, this is working great. Everybody who's had to do it has put the solar on the roof. There have been no problems whatsoever, but we didn't really ask about um, the smaller percentage piece. And um, Shelley was the one who thought the smaller percentage piece was a good idea which is why I was hoping that um, she should be here and I don't really wanna speak for her. So I'm sort of interested. I think if those of you think it's better to get rid of the gray and put the yellow back in, that's fine. If you wanna keep the gray and get rid of the yellow, that's fine too. I don't wanna speak for Shelly one way or the other. Great, thank you for that additional clarification, Jean, on, on where those two sections came from. Uh, so let's let's just go through again um, for discussion and and see what the members of the board um, are thinking on this one, and we'll start with Ken. I would vote for the yellow. Okay. 
uh, Melissa. I'm fine with the yellow. I mean, overall, I'm supportive of the whole like article. I mean, I think if I have to comment now on the yellow versus the gray, I'd probably go with the yellow. Okay, Steve. I would favor retaining the yellow and striking the gray. So that it's clearer and the applicants know what to expect. Great. Um, I, I would agree with that as well. I think that um, making a, a clear standard um, is important and we, um, I, I think I'd prefer to keep the yellow as well. I'm sorry we didn't make it gold because then we get to say, let's go with the gold. Go with the gold. <laughs> Be a great way well, to end. You know it's late at night when those are the jokes that I <laughs> All right, Jean, are you comfortable with that? Yes. I mean, yeah, again, I wish Shelly was here to choose between the two or to try to explain, but I think this is fine too. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, so with that, is there a, a motion to recommend action on Article 30 as amended? Yes. Uh Motion to recommend action. Second. Okay, we'll take a vote starting with Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I am a yes as well. All right. Uh, so that brings us to the end of agenda item number one. I'm trying to get back into my agenda. Give me one second, please. All right, um, so that brings us to the end of uh, agenda item number one, the zoning warrant articles. Um, so as next steps, um, Jenny and Kelly, Thank you so much for all of the work we will we know you will now be doing between now and, and Thursday to pull together this um, memo to town meeting, which we will then review at our uh, Thursday evening agenda. And um, Jenny Kelly, is there anything that you would like to add regarding process as we move forward? Uh, no, I think um, you'll have the draft report to town meeting by tomorrow afternoon and look forward to the discussion of it on Thursday. That's it. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to um, the members of the department and all of the petitioners and members of the public who've weighed in on all of the articles. All of your comments are very much appreciated um, and led to um, some really wonderful dialogue, um, again, for, for all of these 18 zoning board articles. So thank you so much. All right, uh, so at this time we'll move to agenda item number two, which are uh, which is the review of meeting minutes. And we'll start with the meeting minutes for uh, March 7th. Um, and I will just run through and see if anyone has any modifications, starting with Jean. I um, submitted my modifications to all three of them um, earlier today. Okay, great, thank you. Steve? Uh, nothing beyond what I submitted earlier. Okay, uh, Kim? Yes, I had one, but I'm not sure which date it was. I'm trying to find out. <laughs> I'll come back to you. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm fine with them. Okay. Um, Jenny, if you can go to page five on these. Uh, near the bottom. So uh, where it's at the paragraph that starts near the bottom, the chair opened the floor to the board um, and it says, uh, seeing none, I think it was the chair opened the floor to the board. If you keep going up, um, it's uh, the one, two, three, fourth paragraph on the bottom, the chair opened the floor to the board for comment. And then that, that makes more sense because we we're seeing none. Um, and then, under on page six, um, where it says under under Mr. Re Revelak recommended the next line down, the chair asked if there was a motion to continue. Um, if you can just add the public hearing.
Thank you. Kim, did you find? Yes, it's on, um, and I'm not sure why I highlighted it now. It was on uh, the first one page is four of six. Just after all those letters I had to read. So um, I maybe became a little cockeyed. Uh, it says, Mr. Lau objected to the use of banks and offices. I'm not sure what I would, what I meant by that or what. I think it was, um, we were removing that those words from the draft amendment at the time. So it might not be objected to the use of, but asked to delete banks and offices. As a non-active use? Yeah, that was what we removed. It used to be a call out of yeah. just those two specific uses. Okay, then never mind. I don't know what I was. I had it all exactly. yellowed, but for some reason, I don't know what I was trying to question. Is this a better way of phrasing it or from the description? Yes. I, I'll come back. Thank you, it. Jenny. Great. Thank yes. you. Um, any other corrections or changes? All right. Is there a motion to approve the March 7th, 2022 meeting minutes as amended? So motion. Second. I'll second. Take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So the meeting minutes of March 7th have been approved as amended. So we'll now go to the meeting minutes for March 14th, 2022. And uh, Jean and Steve, I assume you already submitted comments. So I'll go to um, Ken. Nope, I have no comments on this one. Melissa? No comments. And I had no comments either. So we'll take a uh, vote to, or see if there's a uh, motion to approve the March 14th meeting minutes as amended. I will move to accept as amended. Second. The vote, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Steve? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So the meeting minutes have been approved as amended for March 14th. I will now move to March 21st. Um, and Jean and Steve, I believe, already submitted. Were there uh, modifications to this one, Jenny? Very minor. OK, but there were amendments. Um, um, yeah, here. Okay. And I think a couple little, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Ken, any additional? I have no com no comments, no changes. Okay, um, Melissa? No comments. Okay, Jenny, I just had one, it was on page three and it might've already been caught. Um, it was, which one was that? I, I had one on page three that it looks like is still there. So. Go ahead, Jean. Well, maybe Which one? Now, maybe it's now on page two. Go up a little more. There. There it is. Yeah, there it's it is. the same one. Yeah, it's it asked why it has Mr. Besson asked why four yes. they were asking. Should ask why they were asking. So four, it's right at the bottom of right. what you have on the screen, Jenny. Oh, the number I four, see. yeah. It just should say, point. Mr. Benson asked why <clears throat> the proposal is for a 4.0 FAR. You missed that one, Jenny, on my. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah. yeah, that was the same one that I had. All right. Uh, so is there a motion to approve the March 21st, 2022 meeting minutes as amended? So motioned. Is there a second? Can, can, we, second. can we go back and look at it for a second again? Sure. On page four, Jenny, please. I just want to see if it caught one of the others. 
Um, oh, wait, this is five. Yep, you got page, it. Page four, okay. Yep, thank you. All right, well, we'll move right to the vote, uh, starting with Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. Steve. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So the meeting minutes from March 21st have been approved. All right, um, so that closes agenda item number two. At this point, we'll move to agenda item number three, which is open forum. So any member of the public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function, and I will call on you as the hands are raised. All right, seeing no speakers, we will close open forum. There is a speaker, Michael Champa has his hand raised. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I don't see it. Uh, no, no, I don't have my hand raised. Oh, sorry. My Thank fault. Thank you for sticking with us this evening. Uh, okay, so at this point, I will uh, close open forum and uh, we will move to adjourn. Is there a motion on the floor to adjourn this evening? Can I ask one question before we Please, adjourn? Please, go ahead. Um, when, uh, when are we going back in person? After town meeting. After town meeting. Okay. Yes. So, so, so town okay. meeting will be virtual. We don't know. Okay. Jenny, unless you know. Is there any like breaking news? I, I don't know about that, but April 25th, you're, you're slated to meet in person, actually. April 25th. April 25th. Yeah. I don't okay. know, though, if town meeting is in person. <laughs> I'm not. Um, I'm not certain of that, but we agreed that we would have our our meeting on April 25th would be in person. So okay. the plan is for that meeting to be in the main room of the community center. And I'm just not sure if we'll adjourn and you'll go home and participate virtually or we'll go over to the town hall auditorium or somewhere else. So we will find out. Is that the one that starts at 6.30? Yes. 6.30. Mm -hmm. So we'll get, you'll notify us exactly where we're going to meet in person sometime. I'll send, I'll send you a notice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the clarification, Ken. Anything else? Any other questions before we move to adjourn? All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. All right. We'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yep. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us this evening and we will see you on Thursday.